Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, and we just heard on the national news, protesters outside the Supreme Court today. But one might be forgiven for asking why it even matters to get in the streets at all if 67% opposition in polling has no impact. What would the impact of hundreds or even thousands of demonstrators be? So we want to hear from you. Will you get out in the streets to sustain pressure and organize, even if you know it likely won't change any judges or justices' mind in this case? If you do it anyway, why? And with protesters posting up outside the homes of some justices, where should we draw the line? Shades of Michelle Wu's house. Give us a buzz or text us. That number is 877-301-8970. You can email us at bvrwgbh.org or tweet us at BOS Public Radio. So this was inspired by a piece you saw in yes. the New York Times. By whom? It w well, uh, by a writer named Jay Caspian Kang. And he basically argued that protests uh, might not change the court's decision, but we should take the streets take to the streets anyway. And he talked about how, you know, when you think about it, the anti-abortion movement, which I'm beginning to call the anti-women's freedom <laughs> movement, um, began like decades ago organizing. And we saw clinics here. We saw uh, people chain themselves to radiators. We saw the cops having to come in with these big, huge uh, cuff clips to get them out of there. So that's been going on for ages. It talks about how um, it, it just, sh even though you could say that the Women's March, which was the biggest march in the United States of America, and the George Floyd marches after that didn't really accomplish what they wanted to because, of course, Donald Trump was already, already the president, and that's what we were marching about then. And police reform has kind of fallen apart, but it d does still matter um, to the mood of the country, and it also um, you know, makes people feel like they're doing something, which counts. And he didn't get into this, but I'm old enough to remember uh, the Vietnam War protests, which at the beginning were a bunch of what we used to call the long-haired hippies, you know, with the jeans and all that. Then you began to see parents of uh, people who lost sons in Vietnam, or you began to see middle-class 50-somethings uh, out there protesting. And I do think that really did matter because you saw them on the news mm -hmm. night after night after night. And we always talk about how in France, you know, they work a, I don't know if they work a 35 hour week or a 40 hour week, whatever they work over there in France, if they're, uh, you know, government employees, they try to take away a half hour. Tens of thousands <laughs> of Parisians or French people take to the streets yeah. protesting and it has an impact. So, um, you know, it does, it, it does, I think it does help even though you would say, it's, it's done, not going to matter because the court's going to do what the court's going to do. Well, I, I, I'm into the, the, what's the guy's name, Kang? Is that his yes. last name? I mean, I, I buy his philosophy. You have to have a long view. But there's also a more fundamental thing which he doesn't mention, is if you're a Democratic voter and you live in Alabama, should you never vote? Because it's not going to have an impact. That's a great point. If you're a Trump supporter in Massachusetts, should you never vote? Because the likelihood of your candidate winning the election is incredibly small. The answer is no. It's a re it's your responsibility. And if you're really upset about what the outrageous act that is about to be embraced by at least five justices of the Supreme Court, it seems to me you almost have an obligation, even if you don't subscribe to the notion that it's ultimately going to lead to change. You well, know? you know what I can't help noticing is how quickly the United States Senate passed this bill, bipartisan bill, uh, to expand security protection outside the homes of Supreme Court Unanimous. justices. Yes, because it, it took a lot longer than that for people to come to the aid of uh, not just Michelle Wu's family, but Michelle Wu's neighbors, the mayor of Boston, and people out there waking everybody up at 7 o'clock in the morning. And I must say, it's not very polite, but I do like the... Um, one of the chants outside Samuel Alito's house. What did they say? They said, abort the court. Okay. You know, by the way, one of the things I learned, I'm embarrassed to say from Mitch Yeah, McConnell, the audience liked it too. There you go. They're going to be outside Alito's house. You know, uh, did you know there was a federal statute? I did not until we read something from Mitch McConnell, I guess maybe during yesterday's debate or on this uh, unanimous vote, uh, that it is a federal crime to protest or parade is the other verb, outside the home of a judge, a jurist they call them, with the intent of influencing the judge in the discharge of his or her duty. And, you know, I, I, the theory behind that obviously is because judges don't make decisions based on politics, they make decisions based on law, so it's outrageous. But that's <laughs> such an, an out-of-date notion. These are political decisions made by political judges. And I, I have to say, 
I am, uh, I was sort of 50-50 on the whole Michelle Wu thing until I heard about her mother. I think it was on our show. She was talking about how hard it was for her mother and her kids and that sort of thing. But when you are... And her neighbors. When you are taking away a basic right from hundreds, tens of millions of people in this country, a little discomfort in your house. I'm not talking about violence, by the way, is I think the price of admission. So, you know, I understand where they're coming from, and it was unanimous, but I, I, I salute the people that are willing to uh, visit the neighborhoods of these justices. This is from Twitter, from Stuart uh, Ting Chong, who is apparently in the audience somewhere today. Is he here? Oh, hello there. How are yeah. you? A uh, close friend of Desmond Tutu fighting apartheid in South Africa. And he's here, as we just said, a resounding yes to ongoing peaceful protests supporting a woman's right to choose. Mass protests in South Africa did much to influence the dismantling of apartheid. So there you go. And I do think protests in the United States did do a lot to um, uh, bring the end to the Vietnam War sooner. 877-301-8970 is the text number. It's the phone number. A lot of you are calling on it. So let's start with Beth in Cambridge. Thank you and welcome to the show, Beth. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for taking my call. Pleasure. Um, I just wanted to say that, yes, my children and I will be um, protesting. And we will be out there not specifically to influence uh, the court or politicians, but to show our support for other women and families. Good. Um, and particularly as um, people who identify as liberal Christians, progressive Christians, I think it's so important for us to make our voices heard and show that reproductive justice um, and equity are Christian values that are not hijacked by the right. Beth, that was great. Um, so that's why we'll be out there. That is totally you know, great and is a perfect analysis. Thank you yeah, for the call. Appreciate thank it. Thank you so much for calling. I just want to repeat something we talked about yesterday when we had the Reverend Zyra mm -hmm. Monroe and Emmett Price with us. I think there's yep. this, uh, this notion that people who are Christians or religious or certainly Catholics are all against abortion, and it's just not true. The people that are the, the, the big vocal push against abortion are white evangelicals. 69% of them, I, th I think maybe more than that, uh, want to want to end abortion, but Jews, Muslims, Catholics, and, and uh, black Protestants are all th the groups in favor of abortion rights. The U.S. Uh, council, the U.S. bishops are against it, but um, I really don't listen to a single thing the bishops have to say for themselves, and I am a Catholic. You know, uh, one more thing, uh, maybe Beth inspired me to th think this. The other reason why protests have to happen is because if they don't happen, even though I am as pro-choice, I hope, as I can be, what I would say here is obviously people don't care that much about it. Right. If it turns out they're not willing to take to the streets, all they're willing to do is do a little social media on their couch, it's a, it makes a statement about how upsetting it is. So I, it, I, I'm embarrassed that we needed this guy to write a piece to have this discussion, but I think it is critically important to <laughs> say to everybody, not just the court, but elected officials and all those pathetic souls in the Senate who, uh, and by the way, we mentioned this in passing the other day, Mitch McConnell did not rule out if the Republicans were to take control of the House and the Senate in this process, in this session, uh, this election, and a Republican is elected president in 2024 in November, uh, having a bill that uh, before the Congress that outlaws abortion nationwide, just not not just in the couple of dozen states where it would be illegal after Roe. Did you see this text? Revealed. No. Please stop saying women, they are birthing persons. <laughs> but, well, that's, I have to say I don't find that very funny. But in any case, 877-301-8970. Alexandra, you were on Nantucket, and you're on Boston Public Radio. Hey, uh, Alexandra, welcome. Hi. Uh, thank you, guys. I love you both so much. Thanks. Um, thank you for everything you do. So, thank you. Um, I think it's Anytime there's injustice and people don't speak up, that is a, just a failure on behalf right. of all of us. Um, and I think it also it's been really interesting. We had a rally out here last weekend. The amount of people who didn't realize how popular um, abortion is in America and how it is the more popular uh, opinion to take. But I also wanted to say we are having a protest out here this weekend. It will be on Saturday at noon at the post office downtown. If anyone wants to come join right. us. 
um, yeah, it's always good to speak up. It's also a networking event, you know? There's so many... That's so a many great point. ...about taking to the street. Yeah, that is a great Thank point, you. the networking Thank you. piece. Good luck uh, on Saturday, I, I should have pointed that out Thank from... You from a Kang's column, he was saying that, you know, a lot of like the George Floyd protests, there was a lot of get out the vote, right to vote, mm -hmm. sign up to vote kind of thing going on. So there are, are the great networking or the, or the voting opportunities. By the way, banning, they're banning fertilizer in Nantucket because they are worried about polluting the ocean down there, which is another great thing that they're doing. And a lot of people with the Emerald Green Lawns are quite upset about it. Jim. You know, you've been saying for years on the radio, and I, I get it, and, but some days it hits me and some days it doesn't, that uh, the Republicans in Congress overwhelmingly advance initiatives that are opposed by the American people generally or fail to support initiatives like, for example, background checks right. f that are overwhelmingly supported. For some reason, it, it hits me some days, but when I was looking at some polling over the weekend on the, you know, the 66, 67 percent who disagree with the court on this. And then you hear Mitch McConnell attempt yesterday on the floor of the Senate talk about the extreme position of, uh, uh, of the Democrats on this thing. What they do, and Ronald Reagan elevated this, you know, government by anecdote is what yeah. he used to call it. You find one Democrat somewhere who thinks abortion should be legal uh, nine months into a pregnancy, and you ascribe that to the whole pro-choice Movement. The reality is the vast majority of, what is it, 90% of abortions happen is it, in the well, first yes. 12 weeks. So they focus on the aberration well, because they can't it, argue against the norm. They, they, they say this all the time. It drives me crazy. Abortion for any reason up to nine months, that is ridiculous. After Roe, you have to have a compelling reason. That's six months, uh, 24 weeks. You have to have a compelling reason, like the life of the mother mm. or a fetus mm. which is going to die mm. uh, because of a horrible birth anomalies. That, you know, that is the situation. It is not because anybody decides at eight months, oh, I just think I've changed my mind. I don't want this baby. And you're going to find some doctor that's going to do some operation at that point. It's disgusting. And it's absolutely um, not true. Now, Let's Marjorie, go before what? we go, uh, 4096 text, and I'll just read the first yep. and last line. SCOTUS justices, Supreme Court justices, are not elected by the people. Face-to-face -face interaction is the only way at this point since they're not democratically elected. Do you feel any differently in the debate that you and I have been having for 20 years on the radio about electing judges? By the way, Massachusetts is one of the few states in the country that does not elect any uh, judges. Do you think uh, these uh, five would no. be voting to repeal no. Roe if you know they why? had to face the voters? You know why? No. I think it would be worse if, if we had elected judges. The way things are going, I mean, we're talking about uh, the influence of former President Trump on these elections, the, some of these real extreme right-wing radicals that are running. That's what we might end would up with. Would Kavanaugh be on court. the Supreme Court, you think, if there were ele Democratic elections? Jim, what are you talking about? I mean, who, where has where has a politician paid a huge price for any kind of uh, a, a sexual attack on a woman? Well, who's the politician I would, that's paid a huge some price? Some of the, Donald Trump obviously is who you're primarily focused on. Or Bill on. Clinton, for well, that so, matter. Well, uh, well, Bill Clinton is pretty. I think he's suffering after the fact. Well, he didn't <laughs> suffer. When, no, he didn't suffer when he should. He's sort of persona non grata mm -hmm. everywhere, which is what he should be. Do you remember we went to the event that just to see it? We went to an event a couple of years ago at the uh, some theater downtown when the Clintons were doing a tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say the crowd was maybe two-thirds women. Do you remember the reaction that Bill Clinton got? Fawning. From his Fawning. Uh, I, I, I just don't. Having said that, I totally disagree with you. I think based on Kavanaugh's uh, credibly having sexually assaulted a woman, at least one. Number two, his crying during his confirmation hearing, and then that yelling back at Amy Klobuchar about, have you ever blacked out, Senator? I think I, the chance of him being elected was, is virtually I think the, nil. I think that would be the last disastrous straw if we start electing judges. As well, I mean, worse than court. this, of course, right? This is fine. This, this is very bad, but I think... And they're going to be there for decades they are gonna, and decades they are gonna without be there, ever facing but the voters. I, I have no doubt if we elected them, Jim, it would be worse. Okay, let's go to Nick in Brighton. Hello, Nick. Welcome to the show. Thanks for calling. Hi. Hi there. Thank you. Hi. Um, I would say that this is one of the few times in recent memory that people have actively been speaking about what it means to be in a representational democracy so soon after an issue like this. Mm -hmm. um, it's As a parent, it's very, very difficult to explain to my kids that 
This is a party that hasn't won the popular presidential vote since 2004. And yet one person who lost the popular vote gets to elect three people to the highest court in the land and make these decisions for over half the population. So what well, I not only that, by the way, can I add one thing to that? And the Senate that confirms those three represent a minority of the people of the country because of how the United States Senate is constructed, even though they had a majority of seats in the Senate when the they confirmed uh, uh, Trump's nominees. The great number I love is, I believe it's half a million people in Wyoming 40 million people yeah, in, in California. California, and they have the same representation yeah. in the Senate. Well, go ahead, Nick. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Shoot. Oh, well, that, that was actually my next point, oh. is just how the Electoral College is stacked. Um, and beyond issues of gerrymandering or political judge appointees, which, to be frank, both parties are guilty of, depending on where you look, I think that it's really a travesty that things have gone this way. And I think people really need to ask themselves, is something like the Senate, is something like the Electoral College really going to represent what people want? And I don't mean a violent overturn of power. I do value the peaceful transfer of power. It's something that we are very blessed with and take for granted. However, at this point, those systems need to go because they are not actually doing what they set out to do. So I hope they break. Uh, I'm, I'm, listen, I think you expressed it beautifully, and I'm with you. Nick, thank you for the call. We appreciate it. You see the text from 559.11, amazing how no. quickly they vote to protect the judges from peaceful protesters, but do next to nothing, protecting the school board members, city council members, et cetera, who've been trying to protect everybody from COVID, uh, from the, uh, the MAGA crowd, um, and a lot of them, it's true, have been threatened. Um, injured and um, their lives have been have been threatened. By the way, Caitlin in Providence also makes a great point. Friendly reminder that Christine Blasey Ford, and obviously she's the woman that I think credibly accused Kavanaugh of uh, a sexual assault, and her family were forced to relocate with security during and after her testimony. I have little sympathy for Kavanaugh after he lied under oath to the American people. Karma is a you-know-what. I interviewed her lawyers on Greater Boston, yeah. and they talked about how she had to move from place to, to place, place to place to place. To place. To place. Yeah. yeah, and who paid for it? Well, I assume she did. I yeah, don't think the government <laughs> was uh, paying for her Who do you think moves. is planning for the court's security? <laughs> uh, you know, by the way, there's another interesting thing, is while those justices, I, and by the way, I have not read, maybe you have, correct me if I'm wrong, I have not read about any specific threats. It's the whole notion of protests being at their houses in violation of federal statute. Compare that to the fact that Rachel Rollins Good got point. phone messages uh, saying they're going to put a bullet in her head. And when she asked, she's the new U.S. attorney, I'm sure everybody knows from Massachusetts, when she asked the marshals, uh, or uh, the U.S. marshals, for protection, what answer did she get, Marjorie? Uh, no. No was the answer. <laughs> uh, Kate, well, let's take a break, and then we'll continue. Oh, here's someone who paid, it made a point. Al, What's Frank, that? Al Franken uh, resigned from, from, the, uh, from the Senate after being accused of of groping women in pictures, and then he had the picture of him when he was still with Saturday Night Live um, with his hands above a woman's breast on an airplane. So he did pay a price. That's absolutely true. Anyway, we're talking about uh, the value or not the value of protesting in the streets after something like a, uh, a, th a threat to abortion rights. The number is 877-301-8970. That's the number to call or text. You can also email us at bprwgbh.org. We are broadcasting live today from the Boston Public Library. Get the latest in Massachusetts politics right in your inbox with the GBH News Politics Newsletter. Stay up to date with everything going on at City Hall, the State House, and communities across the state with Adam Riley, Soraya Wintersmith, and Peter Katzis. The GBH News Politics Newsletter brings thoughtful, sharp perspectives on our premier elections and upcoming legislation. Subscribe today at gbhnews.org. Our programs are made possible thanks to you and Texas Biomed, an independent nonprofit infectious disease research institute committed to building a healthier world through innovative scientific research. Texas Biomed, health starts with science. TXBiomed.org. And Prince Lobel, a full service law firm anchored in Boston, committed to working hand in hand to provide a wide range of services on matters of local, regional, national, and international reach. PrinceLobel.com.
Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. We're live at the Boston Public Library. You should join us if uh, you have the time. We are streaming on YouTube at youtube.com slash gbhnews. And we're talking about the value of sustained and visible political pressure against the leaked Supreme Court opinion, signaling the end of Roe v. Wade and decades of reproductive protection for women. If the outcome is all but determined by five unelected people in robes, what good will a march really do that's what we want to know from you. You can call us or text at 877-301-8970, tweet us at BOS Public Radio, or email at BPR at WGBH.org. We just got a text saying, sadly, if the postings on my Facebook page or any indication all people are interested in is gas prices and not women's rights. Well, that, by the way, that's the analysis is that's what the Republicans are banking on. And by the way, today at 11, at almost this minute, the uh, president's going to speak on uh, inflation and what is it today? We're going to talk later in the show. Highest gas prices in the nation's history, I believe, in Massachusetts yep. and the country. Yep. Let's go to Concord where Kate is on the phone. Kate, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. Sure. And also, thank you for announcing last week about our um, protest up at the State House on Saturday. Really appreciate it. Oh, you're that. the red cloak uh, uh, person? Yes. Great. Tell us yes. about that. Um, Tell us what you've been doing. Well, Boston Red Cloaks have been going for the past few years, really kicked in with uh, Kavanaugh, mm -hmm. Kavanaugh hearings, and then uh, certainly was very supportive of the Roe Act, and now is um, doing all we can to call attention to the inequity of, of the situation. Um, you know, when you talk about the impact of protesting, uh, Boston Red Cloaks takes it to another whole level because the, the, um, it's quiet, it's somber, it's serious, but carrying messages and just what we're wearing is the message. Explain, so hey, Kate, explain, why, explain the Red Cloaks for the three people who oh, sorry. don't know why you're wearing them. <laughs> So sorry. Um, the Handmaid's Tale, mm -hmm. uh, a really horrible story, supposedly fictitious or fictitious, but never could happen here. And of course, uh, women are used as incubators in that society. And that is what is coming to here if these legislations yeah. go through. Hey, Kate, before um, you go, you're the, you're the perfect person to ask about why protest. I mean, not only why protest in America, because... The five justices apparently don't give a damn, but particularly in Massachusetts, where I, I'm guessing, is there an elected official here in a position of power who is not pro-choice? So uh, if there is, there aren't many. So why here? What's the value of what you're doing? That's a good question. Um, it, firstly, I, I'd say it really is helpful for the people who are at the, um, at the protest. Um, and really get to internalize the impact of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to ignore that. I think that has an impression sure. and that's ripple effects that people are going out into society and, and talking about it and thinking about it more than they would have. We really have tried to have media cover it as well. So again, hoping to have that impact as well as social media. But if your question is um, how does it help change laws, I don't know. Well, I think it, I mean, I, I have I to say, I didn't mean to put you on the defensive. I think it does. Uh, I, I think the whole premise of our yeah. conversation is even if the impact is not immediate, and it sure as hell is not going to be immediate in this case, uh, it is part of what has to be a growing movement to restore justice to the issue. So I, and I'll tell you, sitting home and watching you guys on TV is inspiring to me so i think it's working and i hope you keep at it and kate thanks for the call we appreciate it you know i think i know over the years just being when i was a reporter going to all these protests from remember the seabrook nuclear power plant oh, protests that went on i mean they didn't stop the power plant but they did waken uh, people to concerns about power plants back then the iraq war protests got nowhere but people went down in mass to washington for those the women's march in washington was most, the most unbelievable thing i've ever been to and it was so unusual because it was almost all women. I mean, there were some men there, but it's mostly women. The whole undercurrent of danger and something's about to happen at any moment that you usually find at protests, even small ones in Boston Common, wasn't there because it was mostly all women. So, Marjorie, uh, a number of years ago, someone you know fairly well led what I believe was the largest pro-tax 
uh, oh, that's demonstration, right, Jim. maybe in the history of the country, but at least in the history of Massachusetts. Who was that? That would be you, Jim. Okay, and as we were organizing uh -huh. this rally, we were marching to the Democratic Convention. I don't know, it was somewhere in Boston, I can't remember, maybe the Reggie Lewis, I don't know where it was. And the notion was Democrats were not being uh, strong enough mm -hmm. on the need to raise money for things that matter. Uh, we're imagining we're going to be the banner headline across the top of the globe <laughs> with us marching arm in arm down whatever it was, Huntington <laughs> Ave or something. You know what happened on the same day? There was some big new, was it some war declared or something Tiananmen like that. Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square. So 10,000 of, of us got like four lines in the middle of a story in the Boston Globe. But, you know, I, I think what Kate said a minute ago is, which I don't know if we touched upon, is the demonstrating is important to the people demonstrating, too. Yeah. Who feel helpless. And, or I shouldn't speak for them, but I mean, I know I've been in a lot of demonstrations where I felt helpless. And it gives you a greater sense of power and solidarity with people. So, I, you know, I think this is like a unanimous embrace of this kind of thing. Jane and Natick, thank you for calling. Hello, Jane. Hello, Jane. Hello. You got to turn your radio down and say, hi, Jim and Marjorie. Is Jane there? Well, that didn't work real well. Jane, thank you very much for the call, though. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure it would have been excellent. 877-301-8970. We have time for one more. Who's that going to be, friends? It's going to be Sally in Somerville. Hello, Sally. Welcome. Oh, my God. My favorite show ever. Thank it's you. my favorite show, too, by the way. It's amazing. Go ahead. You got you. You guys are really on the ball. I just want to quickly say we need a new constitution that's abundantly clear. Your caller, Nick, from yep, Brighton, yep. uh, indicated those two, the Senate and the Electoral College, are vestiges of concessions to the slave states and small rural farming states when we only have 13 colonies. So there's, we need a new constitution. We need to start talking about it, and we need to petition for it. Uh, if they can do it in uh, Chile... We could do it in America. Well, I have some good news for you, Sally. We don't need a new uh, constitution, a constitutional amendment to get rid of the Electoral College. Massachusetts signed on to something that uh, I can't think of the name of, but someone will tell me in a minute, which says that a state will commit all of its electoral votes to whoever wins the popular majority nationally. And as soon as enough states to represent a majority of the electoral votes sign on to that, that becomes the uh, law of the uh, land without the pain of a constitutional amendment. So it may not be as far away as you think. Thank you all for your calls. We appreciate it. Okay, we are moving on. The National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Thank you. Thank you. Whoever is responsible thank you, thank for that. You, thank you. That's really important. You should check it out. National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And again, Massachusetts is a member. Okay, we are moving on. We're going to talk with Trenny Kusnarek, our sports authority. The Celtics and the Bruins are really doing great, great games this week and great games continuing. We're going to talk to her about that. And this unbelievable <laughs> Kentucky Derby winner last week. I think it went one, one race before. 80 to 1. <laughs> 80 to 1 odds. You could, have, you could have retired if you bet on that horse on Saturday. We're going to talk about that. Up next with Trenny Kusnarek, we are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library. <laughs> Time on the World, a museum for families dedicated to language. My original idea was how could I do something that would make reading cool again? The founder of Planet Word gives us a guided tour and shows new ways to experience the fun, the beauty, and the power of language. Planet Word and the news on the world. This afternoon at 3, here on GBH News 89.7. Support for our programs comes from you. And Comcast Business, offering Security Edge, an internet security solution that helps block threats like malware, ransomware, phishing, and botnet attacks across all connected devices. Restrictions apply. ComcastBusiness.com. And the Mass General Cancer Center, working to define the future of cancer care with innovative research and clinical trials that provide access to tomorrow's therapies today. Learn more at MassGeneral.org slash cancer. 
Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy Mardrigan live from the Boston Public Library and streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. For Boston teams in their respective playoffs right now, things are heating up. Grayson Allen just hit a big three, though, for the Bucks. Boston's lead is seven. Tatum, he's been great. Had a huge second half. Oh, Tatum, wow, somehow able to score it. Marshawn ahead of the play. D'Angelo threw his stick and Marshawn scores. The empty netter. It's a five-point game for Brad Marshawn and a 5-2 lead for the Bruins. Obviously, that was the Celtics win last night. First, the Bruins win on Sunday, tying up both their series 2-2 in dramatic fashion. Joining us now to discuss this, a Kentucky Derby win for the ages and more in the world of sports is Trenny Kuznarek. Trenny is the anchor and reporter for NBC Sports Boston. Hello, Trenny. How are you? Good morning, guys. Well, great. To Here she is. Yep. Thank By you. By the way, let me just say before we start, Marjorie comes in this morning. First words she says to me, did you see the Celtics game <laughs> last night? And I get a text from her on Mother's Day saying, did you see that Kentucky Derby? <laughs> It's a new Marjorie, woman. am I turning you into a sports fan? A new well, woman. I, I'm kind of a fair weather friend, but I, I've always liked to watch basketball, particularly college basketball. Well, did you play basketball when no, you? Oh, I no, you no, no. But, but I, my hometown had Fall one, River had, had one good thing going for it. It was high school basketball when All I was right. there. So I thought you were going to say the one good thing they had going for it was your boyfriend, who was captain of the yeah. basketball <laughs> oh, and the football team I know. at Durfee oh. High. Well, I, yeah, I don't think he was captain of the basketball, but oh, he was just captain football, of the football I'm sorry. team. But anyway, anyway uh, yeah, so I always loved to uh, And we had a kid that went to the Celtics, you know, that we, Chris yep. Aaron, we were so proud yep. of him. But anyway, uh, it was a great game last night. Tell us. Oh, my God, it was unbelievable. Well, the funny thing was, so for the first three quarters, you know, a lot of us who work together in sports, we're always texting each other during the game. And if you could read it, and I actually might ask if we can use these text messages today just to sort of illustrate how quickly the game changed. Yes. The first two quarters, my like one of my lead producers was like, well, I guess we're going to have to preview every single position on the Red Sox and how bad they are. That'll get us to eight. That'll get us to 12 days, <laughs> nine days. And then if we do the manager and the general manager, oh, we could do the offensive line for the Patriots. That'll get us to 16 days. Do you have any other things? When are you going on your bachelorette party? We can maybe have some time off that we don't have to do like any show. Like, it, it, we, were, we were convinced that this season was going to be over. It was going to be a gentleman's sweep. It was going to be awful. Another colleague texted me and was like, I hate watching this team. They quit on plays. They moan and groan to the, uh, the officials. And then all of a sudden, everybody just went silent. And they completely, like, the way they came back in that fourth was quarter great. was unbelievable. Like, I got up. I started kind of getting ready for bed, like, washing my face, doing my night routine. And I came out, and they were up 81 to 80. And I was like, what happened? I just went to brush my teeth and put on my, you know, oil of Olay. And <laughs> now they're, you know, up to 81 to 80. But what kills me about this team, the Celtics team, is they are clearly more talented and a deeper roster than the Bucs, right? Mm -hmm. Like, even when they played poorly, they had, like, the Bucs should have been up by, like, 20 points last night. The way Giannis was playing and the way they were hitting shots and the Celtics weren't, the way the Celtics were whining and lollygagging back up the floor after missed shots or after the Bucs would make one and draw a foul and they were arguing with the refs. They're like that, I, I liken them to that kid in school who's like really, really smart and doesn't have to try that hard. But when the test comes, they ace it. So like the fourth quarter, the last couple, you know, this entire season, season series, except for game two, in the fourth quarter, it's like, oh, here's the Celtics <laughs> playing hard and doing what yeah, they're supposed to like do. Yeah, looked like a different team. Yeah, they did. But With it was, the old man leading yes, the way, yeah. I Al say. Horford, is he 30? 35. Okay, I couldn't remember if he's 35 or 36. I mean, he was unbelievable. And you know what? I kind of laugh because, you're, and you know, we love to rip Kyrie on this show. But, you know, Kyrie Irving once said that this team needs, like, more veteran players. They need guys who've been there before. And what did Brad Stevens do? He went out and got a veteran yep. player that Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart, and Jason Tatum all had a really good relationship How with. How about Marcus Smart's and hair? Oh, I love it. The green, green hair. He kind of looks a little bit like a character from Batman yeah, it was or something, great. right? Little, he looks fabulous, actually. It was great. Yeah, it, it was absolutely great. But no, it's it's fantastic. It's I mean, selfishly, it's good for business, right? I mean, people were the home of the Celtics, and the longer they go, the more hype there is around them. We want them to succeed. But I, I like when this team plays well and they play together, they are so much fun to watch. Like, yeah. they have so much attitude. I don't know if you guys caught this last night. I had to actually, like, kind of rewind and watch it again. But did you see where Giannis yes. tried to, like, put his uh, yes. armor on Jalen Brown? Mm -hmm. And Jalen Brown, like, shoved him off and kind of swore at him. And I was like, that was, that to me was 
was the fourth about, quarter in a microcosm. Like, don't Marjorie. don't you dare. Uh-uh. How about, this is not a friendship. This is this is a rivalry. How about when Giannis and Marcus Smart are rolling, rolling around, the around the floor, the floor together? Floor. And Mark Smart go, reaches his hand out to him twice, and Giannis doesn't take it. And finally Smart gets up and goes like that yeah. and just walks away. You know, everybody <laughs> talks about like Those how. Those motions are really great on the radio, Sorry. by the way. It's really, it's very <laughs> helpful. We'll do it again. There, we, have a live, we have a live studio audience. Well, yeah, we're, we're, on, we're on TV, Jim. We're on, yes. we're streaming. Yes. Okay, thank so you. So I'll keep okay, doing fine. it. Okay, fine. All right, good. <laughs> Into the good. Stream. So now we can go like this with our hands <laughs> and everybody right. can see That's us. That's right. Yeah, um, I thought, I, it was just, a, and, the, and that Giannis guy, I mean, I don't know anything about him, so he's, he used to be a big crybaby to me. So he's always flailing across the floor like he's been run over by a Mack truck or something, you know? It is funny because obviously I grew up in Milwaukee, and so when I, when I don't go on Twitter often, but I do like to go on Twitter like while a game is happening to sort of see the real-time reaction from people. It's like watching a game when you can't be in the stadium, right, or the, the arena. And to see how Bucks fans respond to Giannis and the Celtics versus how Celtics fans respond to Celtics exactly. and Giannis. Cry like, baby. Like they don't call, obviously, <laughs> Bucks fans don't call him a cry baby. They think he's the nicest guy on planet Earth. The whole reason everybody loves the Bucks. He stayed in the city of Milwaukee. He was loyal to them. But last night I'm watching him and I was like, I was so happy in the fourth quarter that they finally started to call offensive charges on him. Like, yes. You can't lower your shoulder in the lane every time and he they never call it. He's a big guy. But you know what? That is working to the to the I said the Patriots. That's working to the Celtics' advantage because he's such a big guy. He's tiring out late in games. Like he was gassed in that fourth quarter yesterday, and that was a big reason that the Celtics were able to sort of mount a comeback. Because without Chris Middleton and Greg Hill is just a little, or excuse me, George Hill is just a little. Um, I think still like not a hundred percent. And while Grayson Allen, he's a total puke, by the way, while he can be a good three-point shooter and Pat Connaughton can as well, they're just not as dynamic. I think that the Celtics have, have more players outside of, J obviously outside of Jason Tatum, where they can sort of spread the right. wealth. You know, I also, turned it off after the third quarter. What happened? In any case, we're talking to <laughs> Trenton Kisner. Sure, there are, okay, um, and Jim, the there Bruins, was a part of me that was like, you know I did what? turn it off. There was a part of me that was like, why am I even watching this? If you, I, I get, I get real chippy when I watch sports. Sometimes I was like, if you don't want to try, then why do I have to watch you? If you're not <laughs> like going to care, why should I care? Okay, and I was and like, oh, I should probably watch. Those. Now, in light of the fact that I don't know a puck from a donut, we can just say the Bruins well, also a hole in the middle tied and one two to two. Not. That's good enough. <laughs> So let's discuss the Derby because you know it, your favorite movie, as we know, is Secretariat. Secretariat. Your soon is it to right? be your favorite movie <laughs> is Rich Strike. I know. I am it's kind watching, of pathetic. I did not watch that race either until it's I good got though. until I got the text from Marjorie, and I decided to go online and watch the video of this thing. And the beauty of the call down the stretch is the guy calling the race never even mentions the horse right. until they're about a, a nanosecond yeah. left yeah. in the race. Here's the clip from NBC Sports uh, of Rich Strike, the horse with the 80 to 1 odds, obviously winning the Kentucky Derby. Epicenter has taken the lead as they arrive into the final furlong. Sandin is coming after him. Epicenter and Sandin, these two strive for stride. Simplification down the outside is next. They're coming down to the wire. Epicenter, Sandin, Rich Strike is coming up on the inside. Oh my goodness, the longest shot has won the Kentucky Derby. Literally three seconds, seconds does he mention this horse. Well, you know what was great too? When you watched it, they had the cameras above the yeah. race and you saw how this jockey who, ro who rode six races the day before in Ohio at some little, not some big fancy track, comes down into the Kentucky Derby, but how he ma taught this house, the horse apparently, to maneuver between the horses, which is not that easy to do. No. They, the horse did it twice, right? It maneuvered around someone you. to the right, then it maneuvered around someone to get on the inside rail. A lot of horses aren't going to do that. No, and what's interesting is, if memory serves, he was number 21, so he was the yes, last horse that's in right. the corral. He wasn't even supposed to be in the Kentucky Kentucky Derby. Another horse, so got, another cut. horse got like had, got caught. We had to had to be had to you know exit the race. So they put him in, and he did not want to go into the corral. He was fighting. He was feisting. And even after he won, the horse was did like, you "Get away from me!" I know. Biting the other horse yes. on the neck. It was unbelievable. So he clearly was like a little. I don't. I you know I. I was a sexual I, I'm thing, by the I'm way. Conflicted. <laughs> I'm conflicted about horse racing, but it yep. is so exciting. But what an incredible I, I listen. I don't understand gambling, but I think if you put like a hundred bucks on this horse. Didn't you win like eight grand or something? Yeah, because it was eight yes, to one odds. Is yeah. that how it that's works? That's right. Like I'm so like there Can is a imagine? part of me that's like, why didn't I just throw a hundred bucks on this horse? Like why not just throw like, 
50 on the favorite and 100 on a long shot. And if you win, you win. If you don't, you're at 150 bucks. Like, I, you know. Well, because you'll probably lose $9,000 before another 80 to 1 shot. And you know wins what else? I know. That's I know. You know what else? Usually in the winner's circle, you see this very distinguished crew. You know, you get the trainer, you get incredible. the owners, and they look at their beautiful, oh, very expensive outfits. fancy sport down outfits. Fall River. <laughs> then you see this guy that's, that's with this, this horse. In the red jacket or yeah. red jacket. Yeah, it was great. Who's got, who, 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 you know, Be he, nice, he looks like he's. Got like the he, biggest belly I've like ever seen. He looks like he's like uh, the Colonel from Kentucky yeah, Fried almost, Chicken a little bit. Yeah, his, his belly's coming out between his shirt. I mean, he's just not a guy that was the well, he's usual. he's not Bob Baffert, right? He's not he's Bob not Baffert, this who like couldn't be there, of course, yes, because, because he, he drugs cheated. his horses. That's what I was afraid of. I was afraid they were going to find out this horse is on drugs when I saw him biting the other, the, the pony, when the pony was taken or away was after fixed. the race. How, can you fix it? Well, excuse me, I've told you this story 400 and times. The First time I ever went to the, the race Kentucky track. Derby? Liberty Raceway in yeah. upstate New York. Well, okay. Maybe yeah. Liberty, horse, Liberty Raceway. I was a busboy at Grossinger's. The captain, I was going my first night, I ever went to the track. He said, bet the 7 8 perfecta. I didn't even know what that meant. Not but I looked it up, I knew what it meant. I mean, bo bet on those horses to come in 1 2. Okay. The 7 and 8 horses are dead last at the top of the stretch. And I'm saying, I can't believe I wasted my money on this thing. As they start coming down the stretch, all the horses on the rail move off the <laughs> rail on my honor and the seven and eight horse go right up the rail and come in one and two and i won something like 150 dollars wow. on a two dollar bet it was not it's fixed i'm not saying the kentucky derby i don't think the kentucky huh. derby's fixed you but might see a little bit of that going down be a little harder to do on national television it yeah. might be a little bit yeah harder to a little do. bit harder to do so anyway that was by the way can we have hey, either Jamie, you ever you been you gotta, to yeah. the kentucky no, derby no, no i would love it's to like go one i think you know I really what you gotta find do. first at the end of the segment we need to end this segment with uh what, is, what does he say? Coming like a bolt of lightning, a metal? What Moving is like an incredible machine. Right, we need the last Secretariat. 30 seconds okay. to be Secretariat. If you haven't seen Secretariat... It's, I have, it, it, Here oh, we go. and okay. I've read the book. It's not a great movie, but it just, for some reason, is always... You know, when I'm feeling depressed, I think, let's, let's, let's bring out Secretariat. Can I ask you something about let's that? bring out a feel-good story did about you enjoy, Did you enjoy the movie Secretariat as much the 30th time <laughs> as you did... <laughs> The first time it gets better every time, Jim. It gets better, every, gets every, better time. every time. And you get the wife, you know, that everybody thought she didn't know what she was talking Penny, about, right? Penny, Penny Tweedy. Tweedy, thank you. Oh, you really Smith. have Smith, seen exactly. Oh, yeah. Went to Smith College, and, and they were all making fun of her. She didn't know what she was doing, and she picked the right horse. She had a chance to pick another horse, and she outsmarted the other guy that had been in the horse business for years, picked the right horse. And, of course, then you found out that the reason Secretary could do what Secretary did is because it had a huge heart. Remember Twice that? the normal I size. I do remember is that. that. Not the case? Yeah. So unlike the Grinch, interesting. Uh, exactly. That beautifully is that put. is absolutely We're correct. We're talking to Trenny Kuznarek with our other sports authority, Marjorie Moving Egan. Like an incredible yeah. machine. It is still the best. Belmont Stakes. Everybody can you can look it up on YouTube. That's Secretary right. to the Belmont Stakes. It's unbelievable. We're going to play it in a couple of oh, minutes. Oh, we're going to play it. By oh, the way, one of our co-workers typed you a note, Marjorie. Yep. Did you identify with Rich Strike? That's the 80 to 1 <laughs> because he also is called Big Red. Just like Secretary. Did well, you know no, that? I didn't know that until someone pointed it out to me. So when mm. the movie is made about Rich Strike, it can't, it won't be quite as good because, of course, the Triple Crown by 35 lengths yes. in Belmont. How do you States. know it's not going to win a Triple Crown? How do you know? It's, it's, it's maybe, two more to go. Maybe. Well, the trainer said that the longer the race, the faster the horse goes. We shall see. But we get some other stuff to get to. Okay, uh, Herschel Walker uh, won the. Uh, what you, where's the big thing the, in the? Well, he's uh, running high school. I mean, the college. Oh, he, he won the Heisman. Heisman he won the Heisman Trophy. The Heisman Trophy. I was like, he, he hasn't won anything yet. He hasn't won anything yet. He won the Heisman Trophy back in college. Um, he played at Georgia, running back at Georgia. Here's the headline in the Washington Post. Herschel Walker's insulting campaign is the worst kind of sports idolatry. Basically saying that's the only reason he's getting anywhere because he's a big sports yeah, hero. Yeah, I mean, we, we th here's, a, here's the, listen, I, I am not, I, I mean, you guys know I am not a shut up and dribble person. I, I think that everybody has a right to a voice and to talk about politics and social issues and use that platform. The problem is using your platform to talk about something versus using your platform to run for, um, a na for national office when you don't have the qualifications and when you're ducking out of debates, yeah. you don't know the issues, um, you're basically just repeating GOP talking points. It's at some points, you're incoherent. Like, we don't even know the mental state of this person. You're someone who has been um, accused by your former wife of abuse um, and of a temper and has, has admitted to, at one point, getting so angry with someone who reneged on a deal that you played Russian roulette with them as you chased them down. You have a violent past and a violent history. 
Like, and, and the whole reason, and if we're being honest, you know, this sort of happened with Donald Trump, right? Like, he wasn't qualified to be president of the United States, but you look at him and you go, ooh, shiny money and big buildings. And you look at Herschel Walker and you go, ooh, he was a good athlete and he won the Heisman Trophy. He's a team guy. So, no, that doesn't mean that you should be a representative of our nation's government. And it actually sort of devalues, I think, the position as the columnist in the, in the uh, Washington Post um, writes that it's it's almost like he's used like it's like he doesn't even realize he's being used as a prop um, by the far right GOP like we're just gonna put you out there and even if you look ridiculous we're gonna trot you out there as sort of this this black man who believes in what we believe in and we're gonna tell you what to say and tell you what to do and everyone's gonna love you just because you're an athlete yeah it may be true but I to me uh, it's much more a reflection on the people of Georgia and the people, where's that Tuberville? That By coach from uh, Tommy had Tuberville. No he, yep, he was the coach at Auburn, and he won. He beat Doug Jones right. in Alabama. He's for now a in Senate the United seat. States Senate. Didn't even go to debates. Nope. Nothing. Nope. But uh, the issue is not that they run, uh, in my opinion. The issue is people vote for him. People vote for him. And if, uh, by the way, for people who are curious, while well, Walker is way ahead in the primary, almost two to one over his nearest candidate, Republican primary, he's actually trailing uh, Reverend Thank Warnock God. by five points. Well, yeah. well, let's wait see what happens yeah. when uh, uh, the final comes around. Come by November. the way. Uh, apparently, Herschel Walker's only voted once in the in last 20 years. 20 years. Yes. years. yes, I forgot that fun I little mean, stat really? I read in there. Yep. I mean, it's just, again, I, 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 I mean, I, say, I feel like I say this on this show a lot. I love sports. Obviously, I, you know, I, I, like Marjorie, I get very excited and very animated oh, about too. athletics. But to use that as a baseline for someone's qualifications for something much more important, like the way that we have started to devalue uh, what it means to be a congressperson or a senator in this country and, the, and just the, the partisan ways that we don't even care if you're qualified for it is such a poor reflection on one, the time that one, I think, how much we care about our country and the research that voters do. Like, do you really want someone in office who doesn't understand what it takes to be in office? And one thing that's pointed out in the column is that he didn't yet. Well, I mean, here's my issue. He lied about graduating from Georgia. He apparently never graduated mm. from Georgia, which fine. You know, there are politicians who may, you know, Mark Zuckerberg never graduated from Harvard, but he's pretty darn successful, right? Like, I don't, I don't ever want to Democratic equate. Senator from Blumenthal from right. Connecticut lied about his military service. Yeah, and I was mean, it's anyway it's just like i don't know it just feels icky it feels like we don't care that much as long as someone aligns exactly with where we are culturally and socially by the way <coughs> is this a good point to mention a uh, point to mention tom brady oh yeah fox sports speaking of networks. jobs after he's done with football yeah. this is breaking news this morning lead what, nfl what analyst after his playing days he's oh yeah fox lead. announced today he's not doing it this year we don't know when but fox sports has announced today that tom brady will be their lead nfl analyst when he's done playing football so this is like rocking the sports world and i was like I, okay are you guys surprised that tom brady would go into the broadcast booth after yeah can football? i tell you why i am because while everybody including I will tune in the first time. The guy has not had a strong opinion about anything in his whole life about hi other than hydration. He has no, in all seriousness, <laughs> while I admire well, his pliability, in all seriousness, very passionate has he about ever pliability. been willing to take a tough position on any issue? Well, he can other, analyze the plays, can't he? I don't think it means criticizing something. When has he ever uh, criticized anybody? I don't for know. Anything? He was really good, Charles Barkley. He's a really good oh, analyst. Yeah, he's yeah. great. Yeah, he is great. TNT and basketball. You know, we, I want to not give this too much short shrift. We started talking about this a couple of weeks ago, something you've spent a lot of your life working on, mental health issues. And it seems to me that generally when there's stories about, for example, there are a lot of stories of late, I think mostly college athletes, death yes. by suicide. It, it, my sense of things, I know you follow it more closely than I do, it's sort of a one and done kind of thing. I mean, in terms of coverage, there seems to be more relentless coverage of the incredible pain these things cause and the causes themselves, which gives me a smidgen of hope that they're actually going to be addressed by the infrastructure of the sports world. Is that naive? Um, I mean, I, I will say, I think when it comes to the sports world and just in a small little like entity of itself, I think sports has done a much better job of addressing mental health issues and offering up resources to their athletes. Like it has become a focal point where now you're not just, you don't just, 
get suggested that you go see a sports psychologist to help you work through a shooting slump, right, or a mechanical issue. Now they really think about the whole person of an athlete, but the problem is that I think what we don't take into account is the pressure these athletes are under and also the toll that the pandemic took um, on a lot of young people. I don't know if you guys had a chance to watch it, um, the New York Times had a huge story yesterday on the rise of adolescent um, on mental health mental issues, health, yes. adolescent suicide. And people in, in emergency rooms for days and days yes. and days waiting for a bed. And 60 Minutes also did an extended, Sharon Alfonsi did a really, I mean, it was a gut-wrenching piece. My fiance came home from picking up a sandwich and I was sobbing on my couch and he was like, oh my gosh, what happened? And I'm watching a now 11 year old who at the time was nine, nine years old. And when he had to stay home and do remote learning, he was so isolated from his friends and his parents were going through a divorce and he wasn't understanding his schoolwork that it built up and built up that at nine years old, he looked at his mom when she tucked him into bed one night and said, mom, I want to kill myself. He said he had thought of 50 different ways to take his own life because he was, because when you're nine and you're, even when you're nine, when you're 17, when you're 20, your mind isn't full. You're not a fully developed adult, really, um, uh, psychologically until you're about 25 years old. They say that's about the mm -hmm. average. So you're still, even though you're a grown up and you're out of college or you're in college, you're 18 to 22 years old, the pressure we put on these kids yeah. to, you know, be academically superior, to be athletically superior. It, the, the weight of the world is on their shoulders. And, and I don't know, it's what's most frustrating to me. Someone I, 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 I know very well recently said that their, their child needed to see a child psychologist, that he was having some outbursts in school, some anger outbursts. Do you know how long she's gonna have to wait for him well to see a I'm child psychologist? Sure. Seven months. Seven months. And instead, in the interim, and that's what this nine-year-old had to do, and that's what some of these, and what I do think is better about sports right now is at least, and I hate how much money we invest, like it's capitalism at universities, but money is going into programs so kids have resources. But the issue becomes, especially with athletes, do I want to use a school or a pro team or a, a minor uh, league yeah. team's resources? <clears throat> because what if they report back to the coach? What if it costs me my job? What if it costs me my scholarship? It's such a complicated issue. And it, 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 it rips at my soul that we spend time worrying about a don't say gay bill. We say we care about kids. If you care Ten about seconds. kids, do something about it. Help these kids in need help. I'm so with you. And you do hey, wonderful thank you, things Trini. on this front, too. Trenny, it's great to see you. That is, of course, Trenny Kuznarek, anchor and reporter for NBC Sports Boston. She joins us all the time. Up next, State Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz, here to discuss her bid for governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. She's next on Boston Public Radio. I'm Frank Oglesby, voice of the T. The doors are opening for smart conversation with Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan on Boston Public Radio. Local perspective, local voices. Welcome aboard Boston's local NPR. Support for GBH comes from you and Bridgewater State University, recognizing the role parents, families, and supporters play in the college search process. You can learn how to assist your students' search on the BSU Family Hub at bridgew.edu family. Sir David Attenborough paints a more detailed picture of the day an asteroid struck Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs. Don't miss Nova, Dinosaur Apocalypse, the new evidence, Wednesday at 9 on GBH2. I'm Marco Werman of the World, and this is 89.7 WGBH, WGBH HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. Boston's local NPR. Ahead on Boston Public Radio, State Senators Sonia Chang Diaz and Attorney General Maura Healy are the two Democratic candidates for governor. The senator will join us at the library. Then the Federal Transit Administration is inspecting the MBTA in the wake of a series of passenger deaths and injuries. The agency says it's unclear what steps the T is actually taking to make the system safer. We'll hear from our transit duo, Jim Eloisi and Stacey Thompson, on that and on Charlie Baker's plan to mandate more housing near the T. 
Boston is gearing up to commemorate Frederick Law Olmsted's bicentennial birthday with a series of events all over the city and along the Emerald Necklace. GBH Executive Arts Senator Jared Bowen will give us the details. Then CNN's John King with the latest political headlines, including former President Trump's kingmaker influence on upcoming GOP primaries. All that ahead, Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH, broadcasting from the Boston Public Library. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. Firefighters in northern New Mexico are struggling to contain a massive wildfire burning in rough terrain northeast of Santa Fe in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. It is the largest wildfire currently burning in the United States. It's just 39% contained. NPR's Eric Westervelt reports weather forecasters on the ground are calling the intense wind conditions there unprecedented. Thousands have been evacuated as fire crews try to contain the wind-fed fire spreading across drought-parched Ponderosa Forest in what is an intense and early start to the western fire season. Fire crews have been hampered by consecutive days of dangerously strong, gusty winds, sometimes 40 to 70 miles per hour. It's weather that incident meteorologist Bladen Brightrider says they haven't seen before. It is pretty extraordinary to have a red flag warning to last for 59 hours is, as far as my memory goes back, is unprecedented. Bright Rider says in all, the area has had red flag wind warnings in 25 of the 33 days since the fire began in April. Eric Westervelt, NPR News, Las Vegas, New Mexico. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is briefing the Senate Banking Committee about how climate change is affecting the U.S. economy. She says the Financial Stability Oversight Council of Financial Watchdogs directing a committee to investigate. This advisory body, which will include a broad array of external stakeholders, will help the council gather information and analysis on climate-related financial risks. Extreme weather conditions fueling longer and more fierce wildfire seasons in the U.S. and around the world. The environmental impact made that much worse in a war. Satellite footage shows large fires are burning near the Black Sea in southern Ukraine. They're close to two important protected natural areas. NPR's Anya Kamenetz reports from Lviv on the environmental impact from the war. Large plumes of smoke are visible near a biosphere reserve and a national park on a spit of land reaching into the Black Sea. UK-based nonprofit The Conflict and Environment Observatory, which reported the blazes, says the immediate cause is unclear. Environmental advocates in Ukraine say air pollution from fires and explosions, especially on sites like oil refineries, is one of the most serious environmental impacts of a war that's largely being fought in urban and industrial regions. There are also concerns about nuclear radiation, soil, and water pollution. Some groups are documenting the damages using satellites, drones, and social media posts with the hope of compelling Russia to pay environmental reparations. Anya Kamenetz, NPR News, Lviv, Ukraine. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is down 120 points to 32,124. The S&P's fallen slightly. The Nasdaq is up 50 points. You're listening to NPR News. From the GBH Radio Newsroom in Boston, I'm Judy Ewell with the local stories we're following. Some public school districts in Massachusetts are recommending that students and staff put their masks back on in class as COVID-19 levels trend upward. The state's seven-day average positivity rate inched closer to 7% in data released yesterday. And the executive director of the Boston Public Health Commission, Dr. Brasola Ojikutu, says while the COVID case count is high, the severity of illness is much lower than it was during the Omicron surge. There is no reason for panic. However, we are concerned and we're following these, um, these data very closely. Now, school officials in Arlington, Belmont, and Cambridge all recommending that students and staff wear masks indoors. It's not a mandate, but the mask mandate remains in effect in Boston public schools. Suffolk Construction says work has resumed at its sites in Boston after four men were injured in two incidents last week. The company voluntarily halted work to review safety procedures. A company representative says all of the sites are in compliance and they're safe to reopen. Three men were injured in a building collapse at the old Edison Power Plant in the South End, and another worker was injured when they fell from a building at another site less than 24 hours later. All of them are expected to recover. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration is leading the investigation into the incidents. In sports, the Celtics getting ready for Game 5 against the Bucs after tying it up. The Bruins skate against the Hurricanes tonight. We can get ready for our midweek warm-up. 
Sunny, breezy today. Highs only in the 50s and clear skies tonight. Lows again in the 40s. Mostly sunny tomorrow. Highs to 60. Thursday, sunny highs in the 70s. Right now it's 56 in Boston. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Fisher Investments. Fisher Investments is a fiduciary, which means they always put clients' interests first. Fisher Investments, clearly different money management. Investing in securities involves the risk of loss. And for more original reporting, visit gbhnews.org. He's Jim Browdy. I am Marjorie Egan. You're listening to our number two of Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. Hello. Oh, we are broadcasting live as we do every Tuesday and Friday from the Boston Public Library. Ooh, streaming also on YouTube.com slash GBH News. I want to say for those uh, legions of listeners who are wildly disappointed because we do not play the sound of Secretariat coming down the stretch (laughs) at the Belmont, as promised, a little bit later in the show. We'll uh, treat you uh, to that. Joining us now, though, to discuss her campaign for the Democratic nomination for governor, State Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz. Senator, it's good to see you. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thank you very much for coming in. It's nice to be in person. I know. It is nice to be in person. So tell us why you're running for governor. Well, uh, you know, I have served in the State Senate for 13 years now. And I've seen two things uh, very clearly during that time. One is the the way that we constantly tell working families to wait, wait another year, wait another you know, term, wait another election cycle before we tackle the big stuff. Um, and in that waiting period, uh, working families are carrying an enormous load, right? We've got uh, the you know, housing costs are going up and up, healthcare costs, childcare costs. Um, we have some of the fastest growing student debt load in the nation, uh, some of the worst traffic congestion. And then hanging over all of that, the consequences of climate change are barreling towards us. So there's that, that's on the one hand. Um, On the other hand, I've seen uh, enough times in my 13 years um, that we have these breakthrough moments where we've shown that we actually can do big things when we decide to, when we muster up the political will in Massachusetts. $1.5 billion in progressive education funding for our kids' schools, police accountability legislation that we've talked about so many times, Jim. Um, And so I've seen that it is possible for us to do so much better than we're doing right now, but we just still have too many people in our government who are more concerned with holding on to their power rather than doing something with it. And that's maddening and uh, frustrating and I'm fed up with it. And a lot of families across Massachusetts are fed up with waiting. And you know, if we want culture change in in Beacon Hill to tackle these problems more urgently, uh, that kind of culture change needs to start from the governor's office. Who is holding on to their power, not doing enough with it in, pos- in prominent positions right now? Well, y- you're trying to get me to name names. I am, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I'm, in honesty, it, dep- it varies from issue to issue. Is right? Maura Healy one of those people? I think it, the question is not just are you a person who is holding on to power rather than doing something with it, but are you a person who is enabling that? Um, by being silent in the face of it, right? What we have seen so many times over and over, whether it's on issues of police accountability, racial justice, economic justice, silence is violence, right? And when people don't come off of the sidelines in order to stand up to that, nothing changes. And working families are sick of waiting over and over again. How many times have you guys had guests on your show uh, who come and talk about, well, we really need to fix public education, right? right? We're gonna gonna invest more. And you know, people have heard that over and over and again. And here we are being lapped by other states who are standing up universal early education and care systems, even though we have more resources here in Massachusetts. We gotta stop talking about it. We gotta start doing it. So uh, in light of uh, those kinds of investments you're talking about, I I always do this, I was gonna say your boss, the Senate president, I didn't mean your boss. Not my boss, you're right. (laughs) Uh, President uh, Senator Spilka said the other day she was open to some variation on Charlie Baker's $700 million tax cutting uh, package. She didn't commit to specific elements, but she said, I think there's room for that in this budget with excess money. Are you among those who believe we shouldn't be doing tax cuts, we should be using every one of those dollars to invest in the kinds of things you talked about a minute ago? So for me, it's, it's, it's both hand, right? We, uh, y- as you, I know you know, Jim Curry, because you've watched tax policy like a hawk over these sort years. Sort of. For many years, you know, I have I've been both on record and, f- you know, fighting hard, actively championing 
um, tax policy that will help working families and low-income families in the state. Things like the earned income tax credit mm -hmm. that are wildly successful and that we ought to be expanding and that I've pushed to expand and voted to expand. What I really um, object to, though, um, and that I think we have to be straightforward and honest and full-throated about is using uh, you know, tax relief for low-income families as a shield behind which we sneak in uh, you know, tax benefits and giveaways for wealthy individuals and corporations who have done incredibly well um, during the last two years of pandemic. Um, and so, you know, and we also have to be clear with folks that tax policy is not the only way and often not the most efficient way to deliver help and to deliver relief for working families, right? If we want to help folks that are struggling with inflation right now, let's talk about fair free transit, right, to make it cost accessible. Let's talk about universal accessible childcare uh, in Massachusetts. Let's talk about debt free public college. Those are ways to target relief to working families. We're talking to State Senator Sonia Chang Diaz, who is a candidate for the Democratic nomination for governor of Massachusetts. And her major opponent for the Democratic nomination, I guess your only opponent for the Democratic nomination, is Attorney General Moore Healy. So what are the differences between you and her? There are many. Uh, you know, and it's, and it's important that we be, you know, that we have a, a full, uh, transparent debate about that. Uh, I'm the only candidate in this race that supports single-payer health care, um, that supports uh, fear-free transit, um, that supports debt-free public college in Massachusetts. I also have a 13-year record, Marjorie, uh, of showing up and standing up uh, for working families on Beacon Hill, even when it is politically inconvenient, right? When there was a billion dollars on the line a few years ago when we were debating K-12 education funding reform, um, there was a billion dollars on the line and the difference between the three proposals that were being debated, uh, one of which was the Promise Act, my proposal, that went on to become the Student Opportunity Act, uh, and the other two, one proposed by the governor and the other by House leadership, um, that were a tiny fraction of that and would not have solved the problem of the you know, hundreds of thousands of kids that are sitting in opportunity gaps right now uh, in Massachusetts. I put my political capital on the line um, to push for the full-sized uh, proposal, which we ended up winning. Um, and, you know, that has made me not the, you know, establishment choice in this election. It has not endeared me to the establishment. But it was the right thing to do. And I would do it again, right? I would never trade that choice. And I'm the only candidate in this race who has a record like that of time and time again being willing to stand up to, uh, to forces that are standing in the way of progress for working families. You know, Sonia Chang Diaz, we can talk for a second about the guy who uh, you want to succeed. After his State of the Union speech, uh, uh, Maura Healy is quoted as saying, terrific speech, terrific positive message. This is Charlie Baker. Your response, in part, was no urgency in the governor's speech. The voters deserve more. Well, the voters who deserve more overwhelmingly are happy with this guy. And to, as you know, in the most recent polling last week, remains the most popular governor in America, 70 plus percent approval. Where's the disconnect between how you see Baker's performance and apparently how the vast majority of voters see Baker's performance? So I think that, uh, look, and I, I want to be clear, I think that Charlie Baker has given many years of his life to public service, and I mean it when I say that I salute him for that. Um, it, is, it is laudable um, and should be admired. Um, we disagree on many issues, right? Um, and not all issues, but many. Um, and when, uh, you know, I think that, that Governor Baker has been able to benefit greatly uh, from the kind of politics that we see on the national stage and the National Republican Party and the Trump-led Republican Party and folks in Massachusetts sort of wiping their brow with relief and saying, you know, that's not our governor here in Massachusetts. That's a very low bar. Um, and, you know, not voting for Donald Trump has not made the crushing student debt that many Bay Staters are carrying go away, right? It has not uh, made dissipate the soul-crushing commutes that many of us are sitting in. It has not alleviated our worst in the nation uh, opportunity and achievement gaps or racial wealth divide in Massachusetts. And those are the things that I hear over and over again from voters across the state as I've been out on the campaign trail that they really want to see action on from their next governor. When you talk about student debt um, relief, what are you talking about and should it be means tested? So what I've called for in, in the education plan that I've put out, folks can find it in, a, in all of its detail and glory at soniachangdiaz.com. Um, in the section in that education plan on higher education, what I call for is debt-free public college. And I'm a supporter of the Debt-Free Futures Act. 
uh, that is legislation pending in, in our state house right now. And what it calls for is um, grants to families to cover the cost of tuition uh, for all families, right? Not means tested to your question, Marjorie. In the same way that we don't consider, you know, we don't means test for K through 12 education. Right. We consider it to be a public good. Um, but then there's the, the matter of all of the um, the other costs besides tuition, right? The fees, the books, the room and board in some cases that are that make uh, higher education public higher educa public higher education totally inaccessible for so many families in Massachusetts. And that's what the bill calls for uh, a version of means testing to say, if you qualify for a federal Pell Grant, then we will cover, then the state will cover those additional wraparound costs. And let me just say here, this is a personal issue for me. My dad came to this country as a skinny brown kid from Costa Rica, you know, 50 bucks in his pocket. And um, because he had access to public higher education, because this country saw fit you know, to see him and to see his potential. It was life trajectory changing for him and for this country, right? He, because he could access college and then go on to grad school, he became this country's first Latino astronaut. Yeah, I didn't know Amazing. that. I didn't know that until yesterday. Yeah, but, what, but, but on the student loan thing. Um, Her father's not running, I want to be clear. Yeah, that's but that's Chase pretty, that's that's pretty impressive great. to be the first Latino uh, astronaut. That, that's really cool. Really great. Yeah, but on the student loan thing, though, what are you talking about? Elizabeth Warren has talked about you know, f up to 50000 in in forgiveness. Joe Biden has been ditzing around, but he's basically not talking about that much. He's talking about 10000 Where are you on that? So, look, I, I'm... I'm squarely in the camp with, with, with my Senator Elizabeth Warren, right, and calling for, and my Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, right, and calling for um, student debt relief at the federal level uh, for folks who are already carrying that debt load. And I will continue to work with our federal partners to push for that um, as governor. What we can do here in Massachusetts is, uh, you know, stop the additional debt from accruing, right? For all of those ki those young people out there who are already carrying that debt, they've got little brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews who are coming up behind them, right? And we can stop um, them from walking down that path of you know enormous backbreaking debt by saying, look, here is a public uh, avenue for you that will be debt free, so you don't even get into that hole in the first place. So, Sonia Chang Diaz, uh, it seems to me, getting back to Baker, Governor Baker, for one second, seems to me three reasons he'd be this popular. One, maybe what you say, he's not Donald Trump. Two, uh, people may actually like his ideas. And three, uh, it's, I think, our assessment, I think I speak for Marjorie here, on most issues, there's some exceptions. For example, you'll override his veto if there is one on driver's licenses for undocumented people. Mm -hmm. The Democratic response to what you might consider the worst of Charlie Baker, I think it's fair to say has been pathetic uh, in the state. I think one of the reasons why people at night nod at their TV and say that a policy that you might not think is good coming out of the governor is okay, mm -hmm. because there's not a strong leadership voice in the Democratic Party saying that's not okay. And Baker, I think, brilliantly uh, 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 I don't want to say co-ops because that's unfair, works with the Democratic leaders to the point that on most issues, I see them as muted. Do you think the Democrats on Beacon Hill fight hard enough on issues where they disagree with Governor Baker, whether he's right or wrong, where they disagree with him? I think that that overall is a fair assessment, Jim. I think that the... Um, there are exceptions. There are some exceptions to that. You know, uh, we finally have come many years. Uh, you know, many years into the fight, we have come to a place where um, legislative leadership and I and I thank them for this are standing up on the issue of driver's licenses, yeah. um, so that we can follow many other states mm -hmm. in the nation that ha see fit to give uh, driver's licenses to you know people who qualify. Um, for many of whom have been essential workers all through this pandemic, right? Keeping our economy running, keeping us fed, mm -hmm. keeping our elders, uh, you know, cared for, um, that they ought to be able to have driver's licenses to get to and from work and their own medical appointments and the like. So we are we are putting that bill on the governor's desk uh, in spite of his veto threat, and we are prepared to override it. So there are some some exceptions. Yeah, there are. But you know, it has been 20 years, I think, you know, in the making uh, for us to get that bill on the governor's desk, and that's too long. That's too long, and you know that's uh, you know when I think about the example of the Student Opportunity Act, it was a five-year battle uh, to get that bill on the governor's. Well, let desk. me give you another example. Uh, I am stunned that there is not nonstop conversation uh, prompted by the Democrats about the 76 dead veterans at the Holyoke 
soldiers home. Uh, we have a Globe report that I think credibly suggests that people higher in the Baker administration, not the governor, but some of his people knew more than they said they knew and could have fixed this problem in advance. There was a set of hearings. I interviewed the two co-chairs. Uh, but uh, uh, another recent story in the Globe, uh, about a week or so ago, in terms of Governor Baker's suggestion, a selection of Walsh, who ended up being the guy that presided over the death of these 76 people. How do you explain what I would consider to be the almost silence in the face of the worst COVID tragedy in Massachusetts, one of the worst in the country over the last couple of years? I don't care to explain it, Jim. That's why I'm running for governor, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's a problem. I think it's a problem. And like I said, you know, there are there are many issues that I have disagreed with the governor on. His handling of uh, the Holyoke Soldiers Home certainly is, uh, you know, one of them. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a way you can disagree uh, while still carrying on civil discourse and civil debate, right? Uh, and, and that is going to be the case in this election, right? It's going to be fact-based. Um, but we can talk about facts, and we can talk about places where we disagree. So have the Democrats on Beacon Hill, for the most part, failed on that front, in your estimation? I think, that, you know, it's just a, it's a pattern, right? It's not just on that front. Holyoke Soldiers Home, I think we, we could have and should have and need to continue to shine the spotlight. I also think about um, the things that uh, the Boston Globe has brought to light through their spotlight investigation on our Department of Corrections, right? Really, really troubling. I mean, that's a nice word for it. Um, things that are going on in our DOC, in your and my name, right, and with our tax dollars, mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, just so much opacity and, and um, uh, you know, blocking of uh, visibility into what's going on in the DOC. And we need to be keeping the, the spotlight on that. And we ha need deep culture change in our DOC is another example of where we failed to do that. You know, speaking, uh, Senator Sonia Chang, Chang Diaz, of op opacity and, and lack of transparency, um, there was just a vote up on Beacon Hill on sports betting, and I was surprised that it was a voice vote in the Senate. Did did you object to that or made any raise, raise any concerns about that? People don't know how their representatives voted. You Senators. know, I right. Senators voted, right? Senators. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sen oh, you, you mean lower our <laughs> representative? Yeah. Yes. I honestly, Marjorie, I, I had also uh, just sort of assumed that it was going to be a, a roll call vote on the final bill. I was prepared for that. Uh, I think my colleagues generally were. Um, I'm not sure why it was done as a voice vote rather than a roll call. Um, you know, and this is something that I have pushed for. This is another example, right? I said I have a 13-year record of, of uh, pushing for change on Beacon Hill, even when it's not politically convenient. Um, and you know, every time that we've had the opportunity to vote for rules reform uh, in the legislature to make our proceedings more transparent, I have done so. Um, to make our committee votes, you know, public online, so people don't have to jump through hoops to request them and get them. Every committee that I've ever chaired, as a matter of policy, we will make those votes uh, available to anyone who asks for them because that, you know, that's the people's house and it's the people's right. business we're doing up there. So I don't know why there wasn't a roll call vote. It caught me a little bit by surprise. You know, I did not call, stand up and, and ask for one. It's not, you know, th that bill is. It, it was just something that was not on my radar as something that people were going to sort of. Uh, you know, miss if we, because we, we, we have voice votes fairly frequently. Yeah. That's not uncommon. Um, How would you have voted on that? I voted, well, uh, you know, as part of the voice vote, I voted yes on the final bill. I do want to just draw to light here another example of an amendment within the context of that bill that I pushed for, um, which was a racial equity amendment in the bill, which ultimately failed. Um, but we got, I think, 14 votes. It was a roll call vote. Uh, and uh, that would have required the state to use the Massport model that we've been uh, you know, proving here in Boston of requiring a certain percentage of the score that bidders get when they come to bid for, a, in this case, a sports betting license um, to be weighted based on their DEI plan, their diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. And um, you know, this is an example. It was not uh, you know, politically comfortable. It was not popular uh, with leadership in the moment. But if we're not going we to, if, we, if we're serious about closing the racial wealth divide in this state, we have to take every opportunity before us um, to weave that work into every piece of policy and not just sort of do it as a, you know, we'll do uh, you know, racial justice over here as a side hustle. So you have, you have the Democratic Convention is June 3rd and 4th. Mm -hmm. 
And under the rules, you need 15% of the delegates to vote for you to make it onto the primary ballot in September. Did you have the 15%? I'm confident. I feel solid about where we are going into convention. You never know exactly, you know, what the percentage is going to be going in because the denominator wiggles a little bit depending on who shows up on convention day. Um, but no, I felt very solid about uh, where we were even coming out of caucuses uh, back in February and March. Um, even in this very insider environment of Democratic caucuses, we found that the vast majority of delegates were undecided. That's good for us. And we have been, uh, you know, working those votes and we'll continue to work those votes up until convention day. Now, if I ask you how much you enjoy campaigning, you're going to tell the truth or <laughs> you're not going to tell the truth, right? You're going to say, I, will tell you I the love truth. meeting <laughs> every individual voter and every... How do you really feel about campaigning. Well, look, I think, Jim, it's like if I asked you, how do you love being a radio host, right? Do you love every part of it? I do you love, love every, every second <laughs> no, of he never, every he day. No, he never complains, Senator. Every day. Never complains. Ha -ha. Like, uh -huh. like every job, right? Like every job, there are parts of it you love, yep. and there are parts of it that make you want to tear your hair out a little bit. Um, you know, the thing, like, it, it's, it is a grueling schedule. I don't love being taken away, you know, from my family, from my kids. Um, but I, you know, this is something that I believe deeply in. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm called to this mission. And so uh, the honest truth is, you know, this is, this is not, uh, you know, a BS answer for you, Jim. When I wake up in the morning, I feel privileged to go to work doing something that I believe in and fighting for a cause that I believe in. And, um, you know, even the things that people think are going to be, uh, you know, no fun or, you know, uh, asking people for campaign donations, things like that. Sometimes it brings you into communion with someone that you never would have met otherwise. And you people open up to you in ways that they would never have with a regular conversation outside of the context of a campaign where you get to ask people, what are the things you really believe in? What do you feel strongly about in our community? And they'll talk to me about that stuff. It's kind of amazing. Sort of like Pledge yeah. Week here at GBA. That's Don't right. Like? That's, a, that's absolutely true, Jim. If, if we're talking to uh, uh, State Senator Sonia Chang Diaz, who's running for governor. You know, if you were governor today, this is a really upsetting story. I know you've been spoken a lot about environmental justice. Um, this, we find out that the State Department of Transportation dumped this massive pile of rubble containing asbestos just a few hundred feet from a housing development, and the highway administrator for the Department of Transportation has conceded that his agency never told Chelsea that this is going to arrive in their house, and needless to say, the people in the housing development are kind of beside themselves. It's a huge danger sign saying asbestos may cause cancer outside this big pile of rubble. Uh, what would you do if you were the governor? So, <laughs> yeah, it's infuriating, right? It makes smoke come out of your ears when you see stories like these. That is why uh, every year uh, since I came into office, up until it was passed uh, you know, last year as a part of the um, Climate Roadmap Bill, I have filed and fought for uh, environmental justice legislation so that we have a framework in our law um, for uh, making sure that when we make, you know, permitting, siting decisions, things like that, um, that it has to be done, you know, proactively through an environmental justice framework as a state. Um, so, you know, what happened with this, you know, decision to dump, I have to, you know, imagine that it was, you know, facts will come to light, we'll see what happened, but I have to imagine it did not go through any kind of um, rigorous decision-making process. Um, and this is an issue, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm bullish on. Marjorie, and, it, and it's not just in the context of uh, where we put stuff, right? We need to, uh, for sure, uh, make sure that those decisions are rigorous and that communities of color, immigrant communities, low-income communities are at the table before those decisions are made um, in order to avert harm. But it can't, it's also, environmental justice is also about making sure that the communities that have been front in line for the negative effects of environmental pollution and degradation are also at the front of the line for the positive impacts of a green energy transition, right? And that's what my Green New Deal plan calls for. Again, folks can find it at soniachangdias.com. <laughs> um, and, you know, it calls for things like not just investing in electric vehicles, right, to hit our emissions reduction targets in our transportation sector, because that's great for people who drive individual cars and have enough money to afford an individual electric vehicle. Um, but we also need to make, you know, at least that kind of intense investment in our public transportation 
infrastructure so that we are giving that we are pulling into the work of emissions reduction people who are transit dependent um, and we're making those systems more accessible to them and we are pulling more people enticing more people out of their um, individual vehicles and onto mass transit recognizing that everybody who is riding uh, a bus or a train in Massachusetts is a soldier in the fight um, against climate change Sonia Chang Diaz, we wish you a lot of luck, and we hope we'll see you a lot before primary day. Thanks so much we for your thank time. Thank you very much for coming in. We much appreciate it, Senator. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks you. so much. That was State Senator Sonia Chang Diaz. She is running to be governor of Massachusetts on the Democratic side, and we thank her very much for her time. Coming up, the feds are looking into the MBTA following a series of passenger deaths and injuries. We're going to hear next from our transit team, Jim Aloisi. And Stacey Thompson, you are listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH, and we are broadcasting live as we do every Tuesday and every Friday from the Boston Public Library. From the GBH Newsroom. I'm Pam Johnston, General Manager of Local News at GBH. Audience First Journalism is about listening. We're telling stories about and with our community in ways that involve our community. If done well and done right, it is a feedback loop. We really are looking at like building a relationship and telling stories that matter to people with them, not about them. Part of your community. GBH 89.7. Funding for our programs comes from you. And Tools of the Mind, the research and play-based curriculum combines professional development and a comprehensive pre-K and K curriculum designed to build self-regulation skills. Learn more at toolsofthemind.org. And Swan Galleries, with contemporary art at auction May 12th, featuring art from the collection of the late Francis V. O'Connor, as well as works by Keith Haring, V. S. Elmans, and more. Additional information on the Swan Galleries app or swangalleries.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie, and we're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. A couple of, uh, well, one programming thing. We should have mentioned uh, the Senate President Spilka we will be with us on Friday. So some of the issues you addressed, Marjorie, to uh, Senator Chang Diaz, we can address to the uh, President. Secondly, we know we disappointed thousands of people when we were talking to Trenny about the Kentucky Derby. We promised the most exciting 18 seconds of sound in the history of the world, according to Marjorie Egan, that is, namely Secretariat galloping down the uh, uh, stretch in the Belmont Stakes. What year was that? What year was that, Marjorie? Do you know? Marjorie's mic is off. If anybody can put it on, that'd be nice. I believe it was 1973. I believe, she says. I believe. I'm Here not it positive. is. Here is the sound. It's impossible. Oh, that was the movie. That's BS. I thought okay. we were going to get the real now, deal from 73. Jim Aloisi and Stacey Thompson may be wondering. <laughs> why, why are we, we doing this? Secretariat. In oh, I didn't introduce them, did I? About transportation. Well, let me do that. No, but, but it, well, just let me explain. <laughs> oh, yes. It was because yeah. we were early talking about the Kentucky Derby oh, last yes, week where there was a surprise. You know, the horse that ended up getting in the race the last day actually won the race, and I was saying mm. it was a great day, but not as great a day as when Secretariat won the Belmont Stakes by 35 lengths. So <laughs> there you go. I thought <laughs> we were supposed to be responsible for the 18 seconds of the exactly. sound. Right. <laughs> By the way, we will play that repeatedly throughout the rest of today's show. Yeah. So in a letter to the head of the MBTA, a Federal Transit Administration official, said they were, quote, extremely concerned with ongoing safety issues and still unclear what the T was doing to rectify them. Joining us now to discuss is our transit team of Jim Aloisi and Stacey Thompson. Stacey is the executive director of the Livable Streets Alliance, Jim, who finally has come out of hiding somewhere in <laughs> California on Zoom, is former Secretary of Transportation for Massachusetts on the Board of Trans Transit Matters and a contributor to the great Commonwealth Magazine. Jim and Stacy, it's great to see you both. It's it's good glad to, to be too. back here. So, yeah. so before we get into uh, the feds investigating the tea, mm. we'll ask you both, as requested, how'd you get here? 
I took the red line to the green line and then walked here from Copley Square. Very Whoa. good. Very it's, very it's not too far <laughs> of a walk from Copley Square. It's about, what, half a block, it's right? It's a half a block. Very, very easy. How, oh, I know you. I did took you ride the orange line. Oh, you took the orange line. Yep, oh. I had. I have to do a call after this, and I can do a call on the train. So I took the orange line here, and I'll take the orange line home. You know, that's a very good point. You can make phone yeah. calls now on the trains, can't you, for the yep. most part, right? Yep. And yep. by the way, since you asked them, I drove by three red line <laughs> stops oh, <laughs> on the way in. I just curled around. We're going to talk about in that. Your, in your Tesla? Or? It's not a Tesla, <laughs> actually. And uh, let's, let's not go there, okay? If yeah. we can. It's a very snazzy car, though. It's an electric We're bike. all very <laughs> impressed. It is, it's humiliating, We're all very actually. impressed. <laughs> so it's good to see you both. So it's a little disconcerting when you read the front page of the Globe today to find out that the feds are investigating the MBTA about safety concerns because they're not clear what the MBTA is doing about it. And the guy who runs the MBTA has known about this one since... Since mid-April. Yes, since mid-April, and we're just hearing about this now. So uh, what do we make of this, Stacey? Yes, well, I think if you talk to Jim or I, we'll say, we're not surprised. And we said the same thing at the same time to the leadership of the MBTA. Um, a, a couple of things. Jim and I took the train today. By and large, the MBTA is one of the safest ways to travel, even though we have questions for leadership about what they're doing to ensure that it's the safest system in the country. Um, having said that, it is concerning that the FTA shared this letter at some point in mid-April, and at the April 28th board meeting, um, there was no mention of it by Betsy Taylor, who this letter was directed to, mm. by others on the administration, right? That was an opportunity for the board to be transparent, to share the conversations they're having with the FTA, and that has nothing to do hmm. with the specific incident and that um, that investigation. Jim, before you yeah. weigh, you weigh in on that, if Ms. Taylor was here right now, and we said what possible excuses there for <coughs> having sat on this letter for 12 days, not mentioning in the meeting, and then sitting on it right. a, 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 in addition another whatever week and a half until the Globe story. What would her answer be? Well, I don't know what her answer would be. I, I think this points out to the need for this board. You know, we've had a conversation about this board needing to inspire confidence. Because a lot of us felt good about the prior board. Uh -huh. And transparency it may be the first and foremost way to inspire that confidence. And so I think, I don't know how to answer it because I wouldn't, hopefully, <laughs> if I were in that position, I wouldn't be in that position. Um, I do think that people, it's one thing for a new board to say, look, we want to have a hands-off approach. We don't want to get into the weeds like the prior board did. That's, that's appropriate. I, I can get that. But there's a difference between saying we don't want to micromanage and we want to step so far back from things that we're simply going to sacrifice public confidence because there's a sense that we're not being transparent. I don't mean to beat this thing to death, right. but it also reflects to me a level of naivete that should not <laughs> exist in people in those positions. Well. It's not like <laughs> if we don't mention it on the 20, at our meeting on the 28th, mm -hmm. it's never going to come out. The question is, the clock is ticking. At some point, the public's going to know about it. And right. at some point, somebody's going to stick a mic in, Pof in Steve Poftek's uh, mm -hmm. uh, face or Ms. Ta Betsy Taylor's her name? Betsy, Betsy Taylor. Taylor. Yeah. And say, what's up here? Yeah, I mean, I, I have, I've done it, right? When you raise your right hand and you take an oath and you go yeah. into a... You should have every expectation that nothing you do is can be kept quiet or silent. Nor should, nor it, should be, it be. Exactly. Nor should it be. And I think, unfortunately, um, this is a lesson that had to be learned in this context. And I think, really, it comes down to the issue of are you inspiring public confidence in the system or not? I think there's a lot to be confident in. As Stacy said, the system is safe. But you undermine that confidence I when agree. you don't be upfront with people. Well, we also just had a very harrowing, tragic story uh, that I think scares people to death when uh, faulty equipment was blamed for dragging a passenger on the red line. Bruce, mm -hmm. uh, I just read this piece, Bruce Mall in the Commonwealth Magazine. I mean, that's yeah. everyone's nightmare, is it not? I completely agree. I think that there's a balance here, right? So it's my job at Livable Streets to know when people die on our streets, when people die biking, when people, you know, that is part of my job. And what, and what I can say is if you look at the raw statistics, um, the MBTA is by and large a safe system. However, transit, much like getting on a plane, <laughs> right? They're regulated by the same entities, by the federal government. It should be so rare that someone gets hurt in that way, right? We shouldn't have a pattern of, of these types of incidents. So what the FTA is saying, like, look, 
this isn't okay, we're seeing a pattern. And I think what's important here is every single day people show up and work on the system, right? They are repairing rail, right? They're doing a good job, they care about safety. This letter said we've got a leadership problem. And that is a question for Governor Baker to answer because he appointed this board. He is directly responsible for the leadership and Senator Spilka and <laughs> the legislature, what are they doing? Are they holding a hearing? Are they following up? This is a leadership problem. Speaking of Baker, uh, we were gonna do this a little later, but since we talked about the governor, you brought up the governor, Stacy. Uh, reading the story about the resistance uh, by several dozen communities out of 175 to this initiative that became law or requiring zoning, not the actual building of housing, I don't think, but the zoning that would allow for tens of thousands of additional units near T-stops, to me is as obvious and right as virtually anything that one can possibly do, and good for Baker, in my opinion at least, mm -hmm. he'll tell me if I'm nuts in a second, for advancing this. And the response from the, some of the communities, at least according to the reporting in the Boston Globe, is so elitist, and to me, borders on worse than, than elitist. Break this down a little bit, Jim. What's going on and what is gonna go so, on? So, first of all, the governor did the right thing. This is a great initiative. Secondly, there's nothing new, nothing new about the reaction that many people at the community level have to these kinds of initiatives to bring more housing, particularly transit-oriented development. It happens in California, it happens here. It's not unique to Massachusetts and it's not even unique to our times, right? And so you can ask the question, what, what is it that is so challenging about this? And th the part of the answer is that anytime you ask people to move out of the comfort zone that they've established for where they wanna live, you, cr you have the potential for a pushback or a backlash. And I think that's what we're seeing. Now people can make all kinds of uh, deliberations about, well, is it racism that's causing this? Is it income inequality, that, uh, uh, bias that's causing this? It's probably a variety of factors that cause people to fear that kind of change. Um, but, you know, if you take a poll and you ask some of those same people, well, you know, tell me, if, do you think we have a, a, a climate crisis? They'd probably say yes. And do we need to reduce emissions? Oh, of course, yes, we do. Are there too many cars uh, on the road? Are there too many of cars course, on the yes. road? Are, are you frustrated with congestion? Absolutely, right? Should we have a more equitable society? No question. Ask them those, right? Bring it home. Now, will you do your part in your community to help make that happen in a small way? Well, I don't know. Um, and <laughs> this is human behavior we're talking about, which is very difficult for government through policy to change, right? And so what those of us who are advocates need to do is support the government and help bring that change to folks in a way that's comfortable, right? Because if you push it and shove something down someone's ideological throat, it's not gonna work, right? What we need to do is we need to think about ways to gradually uh, introduce these new housing, uh, to have carrot and stick, right? We need to have incentives to do it, and frankly, we need to say to some municipal level folks, look, it's not gonna all be gravy if you decide to turn your back on this, because by turning your back on this, you're defeating all these other things that we want as a society to have. You know, it's not, by the way, it's not affordable. How, I mean, that one of the so flaws. I was no, no, no. But go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I just want to pick up on something that you started with, Jim. Um, this is only zoning. So a lot of. Am I right? But I am yes, right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what this does is it says, look, we need to. You need to like pick some land next to T stations, and you need to like zone a little more densely than you might otherwise. Like it's a, it's actually pretty small when you look at the whole grand scheme of things. But for a group like ours, we're saying th this could be stronger. And instead of this backlash of no, we can't possibly build condos, we're saying, you have the power through zoning to add affordability. You have power through zoning to make sure that there is a good access to bus stops, that you can walk and bike in that community, that you can require multi-use zoning so that there's a grocery store there and a daycare center there. This is a way to build on the success of a great community already, and it's just zoning. The developer still has to show up, buy the land, 
build the facilities and the community has the power to make it great. So I completely agree with Jim. This is about human behavior and it is, it is just zoning. We're not going to be throwing up big, ugly, gray buildings next to the T with no power. You know what I loved? I love the quote in the Globe. Whose piece was this? This is from Catherine Carlock and John Chesto. Quote in the Globe from, from officials in <laughs> Hamilton. Mm -hmm. South Hamilton, you know, is where the Myopia Hunt Club is. I Jim, do know that. Jim's written a lot of polo ho so hoes up there. The oh. Myopia Hunt Club. Well, in any case, the Hamilton officials warned that, quote, Community character will be severely compromised and likely degraded by poorly designed, yeah. cheaply built projects that are incongruous with the community. And poorly designed so and cheaply constructed humans <laughs> is what they <laughs> well, really I mean, want to say. Could they come up with a more politic, uh -huh. uh, yeah. you know, this is, answer? This is where, though, uh, you know, the, at the municipal level, you got to work with developers. Yeah. You don't mm -hmm. want people don't. to build, Ugly you know, things. things that look like bunkers, right? Mm -hmm. So we should have some design and, uh, and architectural sensitivity, right? Maybe some elegance that goes along with introducing, you know, multiple right. dwellings in a community that is worried about its quote-unquote character. But again, I'd ask people to define what they mean by character. Are they talking, what are they talking about? Aesthetics or something else, right? And they're never going to say something else, right? So if it's aesthetics, then we can work on aesthetics, yeah. and we can give developers incentives for things. But yep. it's a difficult issue, but it's not an issue where you can leave municipalities that say stuff like that, in my opinion, off the hook. Right. right. Well, as Stacey, you said there is the zoning board and the zoning board of appeals. And exactly. In the olden days, you actually had reporters show up at these things. But in these days, I guess you'd have concerned neighbors show up at these things mm -hmm. and working out what exactly is going to be there. I exactly. And I, again, this comes down to the zoning is just the first step. It's the framework, it's the guidance, and this uh, guidance is inviting communities to submit new zoning where they can pack in a lot of good stuff. And, you know, additionally, uh, in a lot of communities, let's say we're trying to expand east-west rail, for example. Yes. <laughs> Sounds yes. like so it's actually might happen. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Um, you know, pivoting to the great stuff that's happening. Let's say that we have a community that um, could be served by that someday. You want to make sure that you could walk and bike. You want to make sure that you can still access amenities in your community. These are assets that you can build around and you can, if there are things that you value in your community, um, the way it looks, the way it feels, like Jim said, you can build that into the zoning, you can build that into the work that you do to work with the developer. It, this is not This is not about uh, inviting more people into your community. Can we stay on yeah. East West Rail just for a second because that was far too positive for this <laughs> show. <laughs> so uh, when uh, the governor sort of signed on or whatever the appropriate uh, verbiage is, you'll Correct me, Jim, if I'm wrong. Of course, he was there with Congressman Neal, who incredibly coincidentally happens to be chair of the Ways and Means Committee. <laughs> uh, after all the years of waiting for someone to say East-West Rail is going to happen, my immediate reaction, I think off the air to Marjorie, is by the time this gets legs, uh, the Republicans are likely going to control the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. Richie Neal will be the ranking Democrat on the committee, but no longer the chair with power, but not nearly as much power as he has as the chair of the committee. And by the way, for those who don't know, a former mayor of Springfield in his former life, so mm -hmm. that's a pretty important part of the state to him. Does all this evaporate when, if the Democrats are to lose control of the House, or is this actually happening? It doesn't evaporate if we have the right thinking on the part of state leaders. So let me, let me just make a couple of points quickly. At the same time the governor was endorsing East-West Rail, around that time, the Surface Transportation Board in Washington approved CSX's uh, uh, application to buy out Pan Am Rail, right? Why is that important? If you look at the decision of the Surface Transportation Board, which I've read, it basically, I know. <laughs> <laughs> really sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, they basically said to the T, you're not going to get anything you're looking for, which is okay because they said to Amtrak, we'll give you most of what you are looking for. And Amtrak is the key here because Amtrak by law and now according to the Surface Transportation Board ruling, has the right to, to basically trump the freight rail on things like moving passengers as opposed to freight, schedules, that sort of thing. Is that why they're able to do that Berkshire to, uh, to New York exactly. deal yeah. during the summer? Amtrak yeah. has a lot of power and Amtrak has money because th the president loves Amtrak and they've gotten a lot of money. The, my judgment is the key to East-West Rail is to think about it as two things simultaneously. It's an in the inland route connecting Boston and New York City, as well as a commuter route crossing east-west Massachusetts. Why is that important for Amtrak? Amtrak knows 
that its shore route is highly vulnerable mm -hmm. to climate. It's not resilient. They need a redundant way to make the connection. This is that way, right? And so there's no money available for the Kumbaya that happened in Springfield. There really isn't. But there could be if we really focus on leveraging Amtrak, working with them closely, and moving forward. That's the way to get this done. By the way, just as an aside, uh, whether one likes Joe Biden's policies or not, when you mentioned in passing the president likes Amtrak, one of the truly beautiful things, I admit Delaware isn't that far as in the grand scheme of things, when his, uh, as I'm sure everybody knows, he was elected as a 35-year-old guy at the exact same time his first wife and a child was killed, and the reason he and Amtrak came so close is because he went to work and came home from the Senate every single night to be with his children, as a good father should, but as a lot of elected officials you fear would not. So it's actually pretty deep commitment to the uh, thing. So, uh, Stacy, it's that time. We're going to have a separate segment every week where I complain <laughs> about bike uh -oh. lanes. Can I Great. Just, <laughs> Great. Is it, just, are you concerned about the character of the roadway? No, can I tell you something? Uh, I, I actually think about you more than you'd like me to. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to do, and I hate when people do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I really like bike lanes. Now, that's what you're supposed to say before you criticize them, is that I've always supported, have I always supported them on this show? You've always supported them, Jim. Thank you. That's I asked right. her to say that. I'll give you two quick examples. Uh, I had a story, by the way, I do not have COVID for people. I've tested four times in 24 hours. I, I have a cold. Four My times in 24 hours. Four Jim times would say in 24 that's hours. That's a little excessive. That's a bit the club. <laughs> okay. Join four so times in 24 hours. I, I that's like a that, hundred and some bucks of worth of tests. Actually, I put hours. it on your card. So Thank it's, you. it wasn't that bad. <laughs> Thank you for lending it to me. Okay, so I go yesterday to Dotto T in Central Square. Oh, no, I didn't go to Dotto T. Mm -hmm. You know why? Could you not find parking? Because I couldn't <laughs> find parking. Well, I'm, not, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Okay. Over the weekend, I had to buy a birthday cake for somebody, so I went to my favorite from baker, Joanne Chang. The question Chang. might be, why is he buying the Joanne birthday cake Chang. for himself? Joanne Chang. I go to Flower <laughs> at MIT. Now, I did ultimately get the cake from mm -hmm. Flower at MIT after driving around and emitting things for mm. 15 minutes. Are you, in all a moment of seriousness, are you not worried that the speed at which this bike lane take parking spot movement is a little excessive or, or no? I am not worried, and here's why. Um, if you look at the statistics, more than half of the people traveling on Mass Ave, and this is information you can look up, are walking, biking, and taking transit. And the overall goal from the state is to increase that number that. of human beings. So what we are doing is bringing more humans with buying power to that space. What I'd also like to point you to is that it was a lovely weekend, and you, Governor Baker, wants to um, offer incentives for e-bikes. And alternatively, you could have gotten an e-bike, you could have gotten a discount, and you could have biked your way over on like a nice cargo bike that would have been easy to carry a cake, would have been easy this to go to a restaurant. This is where Marjorie says, boy, would I love to see Jim on an e-bike yeah, in Central Listen, Square. we can, the we big can boy get you on one. Bike. <laughs> no, but uh, <laughs> well, what I'm saying is, it's, you know, it's not that crazy, right? Like, I hear you, but we're also trying to build a path where we can actually get more human beings on that corridor. And that, in the long term and the short term, is better for every single business on that corridor. Oh, fair. Uh, I'll bring it up again next month. We're talking <laughs> Stacey Thompson and uh, Jim Aloisi. Okay, are we done? Or no, we're not done. Because I <laughs> did oh. want to ask you about something else. Yeah. That, that, see, we asked. We just were talking to S uh, State Senator Sonia Chang Diaz, who of course is running for governor, and I asked her about this too. But I thought this was incredible. It's kind of like, you know, we don't seem to learn anything or <laughs> think, you know, that we are in trouble with chemicals and with with climate and stuff. The dumping of this huge pound of asbestos uh, near a public housing development in Chelsea. I mean, th the DOT says they didn't ask anybody's permission on top of it all. So what are they thinking? I mean, they wouldn't be dumping it in South Hamilton near the Myopia Hunt Club. We know that. I, <laughs> was, I was hoping you'd ask the question is what were they thinking? Because the answer to that question is they weren't thinking. Sorry. Yeah. No. Right? So it didn't happen in Dover. No. Not in Hamilton. No. No. But it happened in Chelsea. Why? So think about the perception that people have. And I grew up and lived most of my life in East Boston. Right? Think of the perception they have of those communities. Why are those communities? You know, there are places that highways go through to get people from one place to another. In the minds of many people who are sort of highway department types, right? Not to categorize everybody, but it's 
part of it is they see the highway f environment, which is, that was, I think, dumped in the median or something near the housing, right? Yeah. As their terrain. They can do anything they want. They don't have to tell anybody. No permission needed. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying it's a mindset. It's a mindset grown over decades, yeah. right? And so when you think of, of places like Chelsea or East Boston as places that, well, they're there for people to drive through them to get to the airport, to get to the bridge, uh, it fosters this kind of neglect, this, this kind of insensitive thinking, right? Or not thinking. Because, and, oh, and by the way, if people push back, well, you know, God help us if Dover pushed back, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we have to get ourselves, at, we, ha we need leadership at the state level that is going to insist that people with that mindset don't work for government anymore, right? Period. Because there's no way to sugarcoat it. There's no way to say, well, that's a mistake. What kind of mistake is that, really? I mean, it's a mistake that's so profoundly informative, <coughs> excuse me, of how people think about that place that it's unconscionable that in a public sector we'd allow it. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more with Jim, and I would just add that, um, you know, incredible groups, groups like Green Roots exist because of the decades of harm that we have caused to the community of Chelsea, right? Like that, and so the fact that it is even a thought that we might, even if, even if you think that the garbage pile is safe, <laughs> the fact that, that you would consider that an okay place to put it, d also doesn't acknowledge the decades of harm, right? right. Like we have, we have to build back all of the harm that has been caused in that community that others are leading on and have been leading on for a long time. So I agree, I don't think that there are good excuses. And I would point to like the legacy of a highway system anyway, that is falling apart. <laughs> like bigger picture, we have, this is what happens when you're dealing with repairs and rebuilding roads and we have to deal with it. Can I tie this indirectly to, to, your, I to your question? No, I'm sorry, uh, go uh, ahead. Uh, the bike lane? Yes. Right? Yep. Why are these, in my mind, we're moving too slowly. I don't cycle for a lot of reasons, I don't. But um, we're moving too slowly, right? This is about a public realm and the perception of it. Same is true for the city of Boston, city of Cambridge. It's how, if we're learning anything coming out of this pandemic, it should be that we need to redesign the urban streetscape and public realm on an accelerated basis, right? To move more activities outdoors and to give people more mobility choices outdoors. And that may mean taking out parking lanes or driving lanes or, or parking, right? And that's, got, that's change that's tough to do. But if we don't do it, then we've learned very little about how to improve sustainability, how to improve air quality and public health coming out of this pandemic. They're all related. I want you to know that uh, this is, speaking of transparency, I would say the exact same thing you just said had I been able to get my tea when I needed it. <laughs> had, it not, had it not been, no, in all seriousness, I know you're both right, and we'll continue this discussion. It's great to see you both. It's great to have you back in town, I, Mr. Uh, Eloise. I, I can't really tell nice you how you. thrilled I'm back. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 seriously, really I, I, I love you. Boston. No, it's going to warm up soon, they said. Right too. this weekend, yeah. maybe get a little above 70 degrees, that'd be very nice. Thank be you well, very much. Be well, see you soon, both of you. Um, Stacy Thompson is executive director of the Livable Streets Alliance. Jim Aloisi is former transportation secretary of Massachusetts on the board of Transit Matters and a contributor to Boston Magazine. Commonwealth Magazine. Commonwealth Magazine. Sorry. Which is fabulous. Commonwealth Magazine. It really is. Okay. Stacy Thompson and Jim Aloisi, thank you very, very much. Thanks Coming up, you. GBH executive arts editor Jared Bowen is going to tell us about some great stuff going on in the Emerald Necklace and much more. You are listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. And we are broadcasting live as we do every Tuesday and every Friday from the Boston Public Library. I'm Arun Roth. Coming up on GBH's All Things Considered, federal transit authorities say they're worried about safety on the MBTA. Local school districts are rethinking their mask policies amid another uptick in COVID cases. And the state Senate is coming out with its budget plan for the new fiscal year. Those stories in all the day's news starting at four on GBH's All Things Considered. Our programs are made possible thanks to you. And Mass Cultural Council, committed to supporting a diverse, inclusive, and an anti-racist cultural sector in the Commonwealth. You can check out their grants and services at massculturalcouncil.org. 
and Trinity Rep, presenting Fairview, an interactive theatrical experience the New York Times calls dazzling and ruthless, on stage May 19th through June 19th. Tickets on sale now at trinityrep.com slash fairview. He's Jim Browdy. And she's Marjorie Egan, and this is 89.7 WGBH, WGBH HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. Boston's local NPR. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Mardrigan live at the Boston Public Library, streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. By the way, a few minutes ago, we played you the stretch run by Secretariat in the movie, <laughs> which was really disappointing. Here's the stretch oh, run Jim, you're making by my Secretariat day. at the actual Belmont Stakes in 1973. Here it is. Secretariat holding on to a large lead. Dan is second, and then it's a long way back to Mike Allen and twice a point. They're on the turn, and Secretariat is blazing along the first three quarters of a mile in 109 and four fifths. Secretariat is widening now. He is moving like a tremendous machine. A tremendous machine. Isn't that great? By the way, if you haven't Isn't seen the great? video, you've got you to see the video. the video. It is really exciting. Yeah, just Google Belmont Stakes and Secretariat, and then, of course, you have to see the movie after that. But you can get a little preview. In the go- By in the, the way, you know what's incredible? When you Google Secretariat, you know what picture comes up? Mine. Marjorie. <laughs> so, so the city of Boston is gearing up to commemorate Frederick Law Olmsted's bicentennial birthday with a series of events along the Emerald Necklace and throughout the city. Here to tell us more about that and other happenings in the world of arts, we're joined now by GBH Executive Arts Editor Jared Bowen. Hello, Jared Bowen. Hello, you know, I've been to uh, Secretariat's grave. You, you have? Uh, yeah, Who in is Kentucky. Grave? In Ka- there's a thoroughbred racing museum in Kentucky. And I've been why there. were you there exactly? Because I was, I, I go to all of the museums, <laughs> Jim, every last one. Wow. No, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. Is it? They ha- do they talk about his oversized heart? They do. Yeah. yeah they, they have the whole story. Yeah. Oh, it's just absolutely. Can't believe you haven't been there. I know. I know. My God. Forget Cape like Cod and all I mean, it also happens to be on the bourbon trail, which helps. <laughs> oh, so there you go. It's a nice there you little go. detour. Well, I've had a couple of uh, bourbons in my day. Oh, really? So anyway, Jared Bowen, tell us this, what is going on with um, the Emerald Necklace and this um, Olmsted and, and a Bicentennial. You know, he's got his house is out in Brookline. It's a, gr- it's a museum that people can go in and see. I didn't know that. And I think also lots of people don't even know that the Emerald le- Necklace. If, if you start way down in the Fenway, you can walk all the way to Jamaica Pond, right? And all the way to the Charles River, essentially. And all I the mean, way to the it, Charles it, River. It drapes That's right. the city, yeah, from, from Franklin Park all the way. Uh, I mean, this, is, this was his project. This is what brought him to Boston. So a lot of people probably don't realize that Frederick Law Olmsted had a great, significant life even before he became a landscape architect who designed Central Park and then moved to Boston uh, and spent his twilight years here designing. But he had been a journalist. He had operated a gold mine. There's that terrific Tony Horowitz book spying on the south where Horowitz follows Olmsted's path through the south he's trying to understand America I think in much the same way we are today by trying to immerse himself in populations and and seeing people and knowing people but he takes all of those observations especially in the 1800s of the south and then applies them to landscape design and architecture of course, there's always been design. He had he was well aware of the great gardens in Europe, but he didn't want to do that when he created his park system here in the in the United States between Boston, New York, and uh, I think Louisville, or there was some place in Kentucky, Buffalo. He, he was all across America, but his was all about as uh, Jason Newman, who's the superintendent of the National Historic Site, uh, his home in Brookline, told me it's about the art of concealing the art. He wanted you to go into nature and find these paths, and not understand necessarily that. It was created for you. But when he was designing the Emerald Necklace, he was dealing with a public health crisis, the sewage that was backing up in the Back Bay Fens. He was trying to find a way to get people out of the engine of the city and into parks. He was trying to find a literal common ground for for people of all walks to come together. And so all of that has been observed in this, the 200th anniversary of his birth, and they're created this Olmsted Now effort whereby a number of organizations have come together to really understand what the nature of parks is today and look at communities that don't have parks, what it represents to them, and bring all voices to the table and move this momentum forward. I'm not quite clear, though. What does someone, a, a real person, do if they want to participate in the bicentennial? Are there events? 
there are, for real people? Yep. And, okay, there are. There are a whole host of programs and okay. events and okay. maps that help you engage with the park system and, and really, again, redefine what parks are today. And you can also go to the historic site uh, where, again, he spent the last about 12 years of his life, uh, actually probably more than that. Uh, and this is where the Olmsted Architectural Firm was founded. They have about a million documents for the 5,000 projects they, they designed all across the country. Is the film about the making of Central Park, is that a PBS thing? There's a fabulous film. I think it's Central Park yeah, focused. Sure. Is it not? What in any case? And there's also the Brooklyn Park. That huge park in Brooklyn is also an Olmsted Park too, and it's massive, massive. You see like thousands of people there on the weekend. It doesn't seem overcrowded because it's so big. Well, and that's a great thing. Is that he did this 200 years ago, and it's still happening. They're still vibrant. They've changed, of course, over the years, and structures have changed. Not all of his visions are completely realized, but this is what parks are supposed to do too. They're supposed to evolve and keep up with society and how society wants to use them and engage with them. And uh, naturally, over the last few years, we've understood parks and open space a lot differently than we did before. Are you amazed there's not a Trump Tower in the middle of Central Park? <laughs> I mean, you think about it, like a huge, <laughs> crass gold building, like 80 stories high. Do you think about though Central Park? Wh where does it, it? It goes up into the hundreds, hundreds right? Hundreds, yeah. And yeah. where does it start in the forties or fifties? Sixty-one. Yeah. So that's right like Columbus Circle. Forty-five yeah. blocks or 60. some incredible. It, it's it incredible. is absolutely massive. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. And you can still be in that. I love how with Central Park and the Emerald Necklace too. You get into the heart of them and you can't hear the city anymore. Mm -mm. You can't. That's some, a wonderful point. Yeah. In many that's aspects, really you huge. can't see it, so you completely lose yourself. Yeah. And I didn't even know about the part in Brooklyn that exists, like I said, it starts by the fence and then it goes down towards Jamaica Pond. And you're, you're kind of below below the street and you're going along underneath these beautiful bridges and they've got walkways on either side. And I mean, it's just it's just gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, we're really lucky to have it. And, and Prospect Frank, Park, I can't believe I lived Prospect on Prospect Park. 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 Yeah, I that's gonna be the one in Brooklyn. I should have thought yeah. of the name of it too. In any case, so A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder is? Uh, this is a really fun show, just happening right around the corner from us right now. Uh, it's happening at Lyric Stage Company of Boston through May 22nd, and this is a fun show. It had started at Hartford Stage and then went to New York, and now is being staged locally, uh, as we see at the Lyric Stage Company. Uh, and it begins with this big musical number imploring us all to leave the theater because they have a tale so gruesome to tell that nobody should want to hear it, but it's all about uh, this man, Monty Navarro, who is on a quest for earldom and a countess. He wants both and realizes that there are about eight people between him and becoming the <laughs> Earl as he discovers that he is part of this great lineage. And so he, the family is called the, the Dicewith family and he embarks on a journey to dispatch the Dicewith so he can move his way <laughs> up right. the line. So this is a musical that kind of is in that music hall tradition, lots of slapstick and it becomes kind of a musical comedy killer, Gentleman's Guide to Murder does. It's directed by Spiro Valutas, a longtime artistic director of uh, Lyric Stage Company who is very, very skilled at taking these big, massive musicals and bringing them into the intimacy of the Lyric Stage Company uh, stage. And he has assembled a really all-star Boston cast. Some people who've actually left our city and gone to New York, he's brought them back. And it's really fantastic. Actually, Jennifer Ellis is one of the cast members. We you met, might I was going to say, we met her. Yeah. There was a, a big event at the library that I think you and I hosted, a uh, black tie kind of thing a few years ago. Uh -huh. And she sang. I'd never met her before. She is unbelievable. I haven't seen her since. Is she great in this? She's great. Yeah, th they're all great. It just it, There's just a fun energy. It's We need a little lightheartedness right now. And did you say, uh, I think I'm right about this, the guy plays all eight of the characters who he's got to supplant, right? So it's Neil Casey, the actor who Neil does Casey. that, and he's <laughs> terrific. And it's actually inspired by a 1949 film called Kind Hearts and Coronets and Alec Guinness, played all of the characters, all of the dice squiffs in that version as well. You know, you uh, uh, mentioned the Lyric Stage companies being uh, kind of an intimate setting. How many people can fit in there? Do you have any idea? Uh, I, d I don't hundred? know. It's a, it's a few hundred, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that is really neat when you are in that smaller space. You feel like you're so close to the stage and there's no, even the ART in Cambridge, which is much bigger, there's a certain intimacy about that too. Absolutely, and I think we're finding this more in theaters as they are renovated or newly built. They're trying to re uh, reduce the obstructions, make a more democratic sight lines for everybody, yep. whether you're up in the mezzanine section or you're down in the orchestra, and, and no matter where you are. Of course, you can't do that with the old historic theaters, uh, but you can try to mitigate it to the best of their ability. Where did we see you to kill a mockingbird, you and I? That was at the Opera House. But that's an old one, is it That's not? an old one. And yep. they've redesigned, have they not redesigned the interior? They there? had a huge 
huge, I think, I can't even remember how many millions of dollars they spent about 20 years ago, 15, 20 years uh -huh. ago. Uh, but just to, to bring back all of that old plaster oh, and beautiful. actually gold leaf. Yeah. yeah, it's gorgeous. It is really great. So for three weeks that you've been here in a row, Marjorie comes in and says, I cannot wait to discuss this bird thing with, um, with uh, Jared at the Concord Museum. And we, it's at the Concord Museum, right? Is that right? Yeah, except well, I didn't see the bird exhibition. I oh, you didn't? Uh, well, then don't ask him about well, it then. <laughs> well, I just want to point out this, this, this painting, this Audubon painting. Here she goes. Painting. Nothing like holding up. I know. <laughs> but, but it's just, it's, just it, it's like a still life with a couple of birds in it, and it's just phenomenal. I mean, the, the, I Marjorie's love basically saying, you should go see it. I think you'd really you enjoy it. You should go see it. it. Well, I'll That's tell you. Right. So the reason I didn't see it is because they just had a huge renovation, multi-million dollar, $16 million renovation of the Concord Museum, which if people don't realize, they have been collecting there for a really long time, dating back to the 1800s when they had Henry David Thoreau, as we, we've talked Here about. We I'm not doing this anymore. And, uh, Are you so sure? You're 100% sure because about Because of that. phonetic spelling at the time, we okay. know it was pronounced thorough, thorough and so. all cut. Okay. Every time I go out to Concord now, I have to clarify the spelling in all these historic spaces, and it is not often what you would think it was. So Henry David Thoreau was among the people who were collecting great uh, memorabilia from the colonial days. So anyway, they've had this major $16 million renovation that really immerses us in this history in an, uh, a, a more engaging way. They have lots of technology, video. One of the most striking things to me was uh, this whole gallery space that takes you into April 19th. And I never quite considered how it all unfolded. And they have this fantastic video that you can watch as you're surrounded by all of these artifacts, muskets and powder horns, and a clock that was in the tavern right there, um, Buckman's Tavern, and it still chimes. So you can, oh, wow. you have a sense of the real sound and That's feel great, and actually. encounters. That's pretty great. But you're watching this video and you realize these, this all happened over about a 20 hour span and nobody's eating, nobody's drinking, they're tired, they're exhausted marching, f you know, they're the British troops marching from Boston out to Concord and, and the fear that people must have had and I saw this, I went out and toured this not too long ago, so bearing in mind what we're seeing in Ukraine right now, and you, you, you put your present day perception of what war means and what the f abject fear of not knowing what's to come next means, and I think it gives us an entirely different experience as you look back at our colonial history, which can seem so far removed until you realize that nothing really changes, it continues in a cycle. So what was your feeble excuse for not seeing the bird exhibit? Oh, I can't because Jay I was so immersed in seeing I can everything else. I can, I can put this up to the camera, you Oh, see? you can? Yes. Well, that Isn't that gorgeous? That How help helpful is that to you for the people <laughs> in the audience? I think it's very audience? helpful. Can you see that on the monitor up there? There you go. Not at all. Okay. They can't see Marjorie it Marjorie will walk around okay. after the show <laughs> and show you individually. Everybody's squinting right now. I can't see it. John really James weird. Audubon, he really could paint there, couldn't he? He could paint. I mean, really could. Point did that you just out say well. he could really paint? I did say that. That's, that's what I did. Audubon. They Audubon should name society. something after the guy. Yeah, I'll we, tell we you. Have really the Audubon society. I think they were related, Jim. Weren't they related? <laughs> okay, so let's go to another <laughs> museum where you haven't seen the exhibit either. That's not true. By I the way, everything else there. We discussed this Harvard Art Museum at night or whatever the hell it's called. Yep. And uh, someone actually texted us this morning and said, how often is this happening? And I looked it up. Uh, the last Thursday of every month, May 26th, of this month, they have this, I think, 5 to 9 p.m. thing yep. with all kinds of things, music, special art access, all that sort and of thing. And it's free, and DJ and cocktails. I was actually there the following day to see the exhibition that I will talk about. Which is the Brandywine thing. The Brandywine Which is show. Philadelphia yes. connected, yes. Yeah, and I heard what outrageous fun it was, the, 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 the night the, thing, the night event, and how many people came, and just what a great way to I experience love the idea. it. I so great. yeah, it continues. So Brandywine is really interesting. Are you familiar with this, having grown up in? No. I'm about, no, I don't think you grew up in Philadelphia. <laughs> oh, I did you, not. No. I grew up in <laughs> Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question Sorry. again? <laughs> We're talking about Brandywine, Philadelphia, not Brandywine, Sorry. Brandywine, Fall, Fall River. River. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so am I familiar with it? I'll say what Marjorie said. No, I, know <laughs> okay. what I am not. Well, it was founded about 50 years ago by a man named Alan Edmonds. And it's the Brandywine Workshop and Archives. And the reason we're talking about it is because this is the 50th anniversary and the Harvard Art Museums has collected a collection of prints produced by Brandywine. And what they did, what Alan Edmonds wanted to do 50 years ago was to bring art into the community and bring the community together by having these printmaking workshops. And what it's become today is certainly a community effort, but it's also about bringing artists of all stripes, of all media, in to challenge their skills in printmaking because most of the artists who come through are not printmakers. 
and they produce limited edition works that can then go into museum collections. So you have major big name artists like Faith Ringgold and Betty Saar and Hank Willis Thomas, who's just designed The Embrace, which we'll see on Boston oh, Commons. Yes. Common. And one of the interesting things about this is he his print is about two further down from his mom. So his mom had gone there and created a piece in which she's pregnant with him. Oh my god. And then gosh. you see his piece. Oh, that's pretty good. Hers is quite that's searing great. though, because as a, a she was told as a woman, a pregnant woman, that she was taking up space in her college classroom and program. And so this is what she renders in her print. So there are a lot of stories told here, a lot of very personal stories, a lot of commentary on America. And the reason that they have, uh, the Harvard Art Museum has, has collected and other museums as well is because they want to be able to share these stories. So they have satellite collections all over the country and now all over the world. So it's become quite renowned as artists come. And they all, uh, what I think is fascinating, this is more a measure of time, but they only have two weeks to produce their print, which is not a long time if this is not something in which you're skilled. But so there's that deadline pressure that challenge, but you have mentors, you have people like Alan Edmonds uh, who are overseeing this. Another installation I thought was fabulous here is that by Cedric Huckabee, and he is a Texas artist who, when we we're having the whole conversation about the 1%, his notion was, well, who were the 99%? So yeah. he went into his community and he started sitting down with people and he would talk with them and he would draw them. And so we see about 100, maybe it's 100, 101, portraits that he's created and he works in some of the text, some of the language, some of the conversation that surfaced when he was having conversations. Uh, you could spend all day just looking at this one installation of all his portraits. I have a question about something you said. By the way, the, our colleagues, I think this is true, the film I was talking about was a 1989 documentary by Fred Wiseman called Central Park. I think that's what it was. Uh, uh, speaking of uh, the embrace, we had uh, Amari Paris Jeffries here yes. uh, last week. <coughs> he had was a great. Ken Boston. They just broken ground, obviously. We asked him if that was his choice amongst the five finalists, and it was ours. We both loved it. The hands clasp. This is was it yours? Uh, it was not my first really? choice. Really? No, I'm, well, I'm d d it's not to say I don't love it. I think it's going to be fabulous. Well, for the sure. City. I'm just curious. There was one. There was another plan. It's been quite a few years now, but there was one that kind of it came off of. I think it may have been Beacon Street, and it, it kind of cut into the landscape, and you had to navigate your way around, and there were different layers to it, and uh, it was it it, it it was a very complicated idea, but I, I was fascinated by it and all the thought that went into it and how wh what a different kind of structure it would have been in the common. But I think this one is absolutely beautiful too. Yeah, there were a lot of good well. ones actually. I thought that I mean, they were on display. Remember they were right on display the over here? The the here. I mean, uh, the, uh, down the hall in the library. Yeah. So this looks really um, like really something. This curry exhibit about a Iranian uh, woman who now lives in the United States talking about uh, being an immigrant, being in a different country. Um, and the struggles she went through, and the paintings are fantastic. Could you hold them up for no one to <laughs> see, will. please? I will. There well, they are. Let, let me try to help. <laughs> I hope none it. of you can see that. Can none of you see that? Perfect. That's yeah. good. The, the squinting is excellent. Okay. Oh, oh, look, we oh, have, we have yes. zoom capability. Oh my God. Zooming in. That's this pretty is good. It's, it's zoom capability. I mean, they really are lovely. There's the artist, and not coincidentally, the pictures look like she does. Yeah. Well, I can do a shameless plug. If you're listening in your car at home, you can just. Click Click on Open Studio and you can watch our piece That's on right. her last That's week right. uh, to see the paintings. But her name is Argavan Kosravi, and she is an Iranian artist who is now in the United States. She studied here at Brandeis and at RISD. And there's a lot of duality in her paintings <coughs> because she is someone who at home in Iran had this very robust, culturally filled life. Her parents championed her artistic endeavors and there was a lot of, a lot of freedom. But of course, going out into Iranian society, she's in her 30s mm -hmm. now, so she grew up with restrictions on women having to wear the hijab, not being able to speak freely, being very careful about what you said in public or what you said in school. And so you look at her paintings and so at once you'll see birds with widespread wings and you'll You'll see flowering trees and lots of beauty, but you look closely and you see uh, like a tree dissected and it almost looks as if it might be bleeding. You see, you start to notice the women in her portraits and paintings who have this very luminous, beautiful skin, but you only see part of their faces. And often they're obscured or they're even literally shackled the way she's painted them. 
And it is because of the duality that she experienced. She said that, she told me that none of this is specifically autobiographical to her, rather it's a collective memory in which she's processing the trauma of her country and the experiences that she's had, but also as an immigrant, because being an Iran Iranian yeah. woman who's now here in the United States, she's not free to travel back and forth because of restrictions. So she's commenting on that in her work too. But she also brings in this great Iranian tradition and Persian miniature paintings where she kind of moves men to the side. Uh, and she had her father send her over a number of um, Iranian textiles, painted textiles that she paints around and paints through and over. So she's having this conversation with artists who came before her. There's so much to talk about in her work. And you'll want to see this show at the Courier Museum of Art. It's up through September 5th. She is somebody who I have noticed already is really rising fast in the art world. So it'll be great to have seen this early stage. This is her first museum show, so this, this early and stage career also, moment. As you said, which I have done many times, is watch your show either live 8.30 Friday nights or watch it after online. And you have beautiful exhibits of all these arts. And you can it's like you've been there. It's, it's just like well you've been there. Well, also, you should highlight something people may not be aware of. Since he is on television, as opposed to our show, yeah. people can actually see the things you're Did holding up. Did I just up. say that? I'm telling you, he's yeah, always I, looking to give really me a hard time. Really I did say that, Jim. That yeah, he could I just want to emphasize Friday that. 8.30 Friday night. Speaking of which, what, what is are you on doing there? 8.30 Friday so night. So we'll, we'll take you into the Olmsted story with Olmsted oh, good. now. And that other great... It's Olmsted, by the way. Olmsted, that's correct. Yes. And the other great harbinger of spring, Keith Lockhart, talking about the spring pop oh, season. Oh, neat. Now that they, of course, they came back for holiday pops. But uh, I have to tell you, he got kind of raw and personal in this interview. We've, well, we've all so. talked to him for a lot of, so many times over the years. But he talked to, uh, deeply about what the pandemic meant to him and never conceiving of the fact that he wouldn't be on stage. So what it meant when he couldn't go on stage and then he didn't know when he'd ever be back. Yeah. Talk about a treasure of this community, by the way. Even oh my God, he's so great. He's really he's so talented. He is just so talented. He is just so talented, and the pops are so fantastic. Okay, Jared, Jared can I mention just one other yes, thing? Yes, uh, the the newest. We've uh, had these light installations and um, art immersive installations in town, yeah. and uh, Lighthouse Immersive, which is the the castle right in Park Square. They just actually we're the ones announcing that their latest installation will be the Impressionists. So you'll oh, see great. Degas oh. and Monet, and this follows. Klimt and Frida Kahlo, which I thought they did a very layered, they, they kind of amped up the story of these immersive exhibitions. So they've just announced uh, that that'll be the next one. I've got to go to that. It's just around the corner. Just around the corner? Yeah, just around the corner. i got to okay. go because I can actually pick out a Monet painting. I'm like <laughs> everybody else we discuss. <laughs> I'm not sure I always mix up Monet and Marie. I know well, it's one or the other. But In any <laughs> case, Jared, it's great to see you. We'll be watching Thank Friday you very Thank much, you, Jared Bowen. Jared Bowen. Jared Bowen is WGBH, or GBH, excuse me, Executive excuse Arts me. Editor, and his show is on every Friday night at 8.30 Open Studio. And you can see his uh, stuff live, as Jim pointed out, Friday yes. nights at 8.30, or you can also look online at WGBH uh, and get uh, open studio on your computer as well. Okay, up next, CNN's John King is joining us on Zoom. We're going to talk about, with him about all the politics out of Washington, D.C. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live as we do every Tuesday and every Friday from the Boston Public Library. Here's a way you can support the news you rely on from GBH. We're holding our annual spring auction, and your winning bid will help keep GBH running strong. Bid on hundreds of items, from art and antiques to gift cards and getaways. There's even a two-week trip generously donated by auction sponsor RoadScholar.org. The auction runs through Thursday, June 2nd. Visit our auction website to start browsing and bidding at auction.gbh.org. Support for our programs comes from you and the Office of the Massachusetts State Treasurer. The Unclaimed Property Division is holding unclaimed funds for the citizens and businesses of the Commonwealth. You can see if you have unclaimed money at findmassmoney.com. And Little Leaf Farms, committed to transforming the way food is grown in New England. Fresh lettuce harvested daily in Massachusetts all year round. It's the local lettuce locals love. Learn more at littleleaffarms.com. Thank you. 
Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie. And we're joined now on Zoom, even though Marjorie and I are not on Zoom, but we will be in about a second there, John King, oh, by yes. CNN's chief national correspondent, John King. John, of course, is also the host of Inside Politics, which you can catch weekdays at noon. Welcome, John. And a happy Celtics fan. Uh, oh, we knew you my were. God. Hasn't this been a <laughs> great a series? I'm so excited. What do you think, John? Do you have any predictions? <laughs> Uh, I'm going to say Celtics in six. I'm going to go six, not seven. See, I'm an, I'm an optimist. And this is my therapy because the Red Sox are, you know, you know what at the yeah, moment. Yeah, they're yes, having they a little are. difficulties. Yeah. But the Celtics yes. and the Bruins are doing great. So, so first of all, it, it has been a week since we had this um, leak of the Alito decision on Roe v. Wade. What, is the, uh, what, what are your insights on the political fallout uh, in, during this last week? What does it mean politically? The, well, you're going to see the, the Democrats, Democrats, number one, because most abortion rights supporters are in the Democratic Party, uh, they believe they have to try to do something. So you're going to have this vote in the United States Senate tomorrow. It will fail. Uh, but the Democrats will try to essentially pass legislation that codifies Roe v. Wade, makes it a federal law guaranteeing abortion rights. They will fail. Uh, and then this goes on into the campaign year. And on that point, Jim and Marjorie, I just think that, you know, we have to be very careful. Uh, the Democrats, rightfully so, cite national polls, you know, that a majority of Americans do not want Roe v. Wade wiped off the books. Um, they, they are right about that. But then when you're talking about a midterm election campaign, you're going state by state, race by race, you know, this will play differently uh, in suburban Philadelphia, for example, than it does in central Pennsylvania in the big governor's race and the big Senate race there. It will play different in the South than it does in, you know, California or New England. Uh, so we have to be careful, I think, to judge the to make any broad assessments of what will the political impact be. But you can just see whether it's Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire or Democratic candidates in Texas. A lot of Democrats, particularly uh, women, female Democratic candidates, have immediately shifted their advertising to try to make this a mobilization issue. Uh, Democrats do believe it might get some people who might sit out a midterm year, younger voters maybe, for example, to stay home. They believe it could help them bring back uh, some moderate suburban Republicans uh, who became uh, Democrats or at least anti-Trump Republicans, so they voted for the Democrats in 2018 and 2020. Maybe they were drifting away because of inflation or dissatisfaction with Biden. So there are a lot of theories about how this will play out. Uh, I think as we watch the elections unfold, we'll learn more facts. And then, of course, the biggest thing is, does the Supreme Court next month actually release the decision as we saw in the draft? Or are there any changes, which is possible. I don't think that's likely, but it is possible. You know, John, there's been very little, at least from what I've seen and read, uh, I don't know if I'd call it crowing, but embracing this decision by Republicans who fought for it forever. And I can't determine if assuming that you share that analysis. Is it because it isn't final and they're not 100% sure what they're going to get come June, or because that What's that old expression? They finally caught the dog, finally caught the truck, meaning the good news is we won. The bad news is we won, and now we've got to own it. What do you think explains the, at least what I describe as the lack of celebration on the, on the Republican side? Uh, it, it's both. It, it is both, Jim. Number one, there are people who uh, support, want Roe v. Wade wiped off the books. They do not want a national uh, guarantee of an abortion. Uh, who supported, who are saying, I'm going to hold my powder until I see what the Supreme Court actually does. But there are others who, um, who very much support the policy of no abortions, or at least no national, no, no national constitutional guarantee, mm -hmm. which is what, the Supreme, what Roe v. Wade gives you, a national guarantee, uh, who don't want to crow about it because they believe it could hurt them in some places politically. As I just mentioned, you know, you've got a great Senate race in Pennsylvania. Uh, well, if you're trying to win a 50-50 race in Pennsylvania, look what Joe Biden just did in a very close race against Donald Trump. Um, he got a lot of moderate uh, women in the, in the Philadelphia suburbs, uh, women who tend to vote Republican sometimes, or at least open to voting Republican sometimes, uh, to come his way. Uh, so there are Republicans who are afraid that in some places where you have key races this year, even though it's what they want policy-wise, it could be a political liability. Uh, and I think you're going to see, I just mentioned, you know, the, how do Democrats handle this? I do think you see, though, uh, some of the, uh, the most conservative candidates and some of the, uh, the groups who were involved in this for 50 years, who've been yeah. pushing this for 50 years, uh, they're not going to listen, Jim, to the establishment that says celebrate quietly. Uh, so they will be pushing this. So we're going to see some tensions and stress within the Republican coalition as well, even though for the most part, uh, most Republicans are quite happy or will be quite happy if that's the policy outcome. 
talking to John King from CNN. We're continuing to get very bad news on inflation. We're going to talk to our listeners just in a little while about what they're doing about these gas prices, the highest they've ever been. Uh, Jim pointed out this morning, you don't hear a lot of talk from Democrats about the stock market, even though about half of Americans do have, um, middle class Americans have money in the stock market through their 401ks. So this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. The president addressed it, um, but um, it's hurting him dramatically. Right, and there's not a lot, let's be honest, there's not too much the president can do about it. He can do some things around the margins like he did re releasing you know, barrels of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. That did have an impact on gas prices for a bit, uh, but that was transitory. And now, as you noted, a new record today, gas prices going up just in the last 24 to 48 hours, spiking again. Um, there's not much a president can do. Uh, so what did he do today? Uh, he spoke for about 25 minutes, about 20 minutes, prepared remarks, took questions for five or six minutes. Um, part of it was trying to deflect the blame. Um, I don't blame him for doing that, if you will, but he's in charge. He said, look, this is started by the pandemic. First, the COVID cliff, the economy went through, and then all the supply chain issues because of that. Um, still, to this day, uh, things like semiconductors, other inventory that is t either tied up or you can't produce because in China, for example, you still have lockdowns in a lot of places there. Uh, and then he said, if the Republicans are in charge, it would be even worse. Uh, but the president in the Q&A acknowledged, look, the Democrats run all three branches of government right now. He understands people are frustrated. I thought where the president was actually most powerful is when he got off his scripted remarks. And I don't know if this helps him political, but politically, but at least it was genuine when he said, I grew up in a family where we sat around the kitchen table. And yeah, if the price of gas or the price of milk was way up, guess what? That affected our family. Uh, he said he could taste the frustration that Americans feel. Uh, that would help him if voters at least understand you know, he gets it, uh, even if there's not that much he can do about it. But let's just be honest, whether it was a Democrat in the White House right now, a Republican in the White House right now, uh, with inflation the way it is and with exhaustion after the COVID pandemic, it's just an incredibly hard political climate. And this is largely up to the Fed. Does the Fed have the tools to tame inflation? How long will that take? But the president, politically, what he's trying to do is say, I'm trying. I'm trying everything I can. Even if it's not enough, I'm going to try something else. Uh, which politically is smart because it's important for people to understand that a lot of people think this town I work in is completely disconnected uh, from the good people of Dorchester, for example, where I grew up. Uh, and so the president needs to show that he's at least trying. But, uh, John, does it, it, the conventional wisdom that I hear from lots of people in your business in Washington is inflation takes all the oxygen out of the room on everything else. And it doesn't mean there are not some people in the margin for whom abortion is the most important issue or uh, Joe Biden's conduct of our involvement in the war in Ukraine. But uh, for the vast majority of people, it's all about the pocketbook or the economy, stupid, as Carville said several decades ago. Is that your sense of where we are in early May of 2022? If the question is where we are in early May, I would say yes, but I would also add a but and an asterisk and a caveat in the sense that I do this every Tuesday, Jim, and it probably frustrate you sometimes, but we've just lived in such volatile times the last You're 15 so right. years of our You're lives right. that I would ju I just urge people, you know, there are a lot of people in this town who want to solve the November election in May. Um, you know, let's read the book. Let, let's live the, let's live the story and see what happens. But I do think history tells us that the economy, you know, what affects people on a day to day, minute to minute, hour to hour, can you feed your kids? Can you get, you know, how much does it cost to drive your kid to baseball this weekend or soccer this weekend? Can you take a family vacation uh, this summer? Or is that going to cost too much now uh, because of inflation? Yes, of course, that's going to be the thing that drives your day-to-day -day life. Uh, but you know, I think sometimes we don't give the American people enough credit. Um, we just all got through a pandemic together where moms and dads were worried about, am I working from home? Can I go to the office? One kid's going to school, another kid's not going to school. This kid's getting tested at school, this kid's not. Uh, they've lived through very complicated times, and they do, working class families do every single day. I remember one of the things I try never to forget is my growing up, um, you know, with a mom and dad with seven kids in blue collar, Dorchester, Massachusetts. So we don't give the American people enough credit. They have to multi process mm -hmm. all the time, they can multi process issues as well. But I just think it's common sense that if you're getting hammered by inflation, as the president, president was very candid today. Most people, on average, got a 5.5% raise this year compared to last year. That's good, except inflation tends to be 7 or 8% on yeah. some products even higher. We average it out, it's around 8%. So you're still losing, even though normally the president should be able to brag, you have more money in your pocket. Guess what? It doesn't last very long because you're spending it on gas and food. You know, John King, Jim just said how inflation is taking the, 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 the 
gas out of every other issue. Oxygen no, out of Oxygen out of every other yeah. issue. Yeah, I was thinking of Whatever gas prices. But anyway, that it's a big thing. But we often have heard historically about single issue voters, particularly about uh, Second Amendment stuff, guns. I wonder, mm -hmm. what do we know about single issue voters, if anything, on abortion? I mean, I know that there were many people I, from religious communities that said before that they voted for Donald Trump because he was a pro-life uh, candidate. I'm now switching that to an anti-women's freedom candidate. But in any case, um, they said that. But I don't know if that's true on the other side, if there are people who are pro-choice who are single issue. Do we know at all? I think it's one of the things, we, as single issue voters, I can't say that I have any up-to-date information that would tell you that there's a huge pocket out there. Yep. But I do think, again, this is, this is one of the things we need to study. If you go back in time, uh, 1992 was known after the fact as the year of the woman, yep. right? The year of the year of the women candidates. It was C Casey versus Planned Parenthood, the follow-up to Roe that was decided in 1991, where the court, you know, essentially uh, shaved Roe a little bit, saying states could impose reasonable restrictions uh, on abortion rights. And then you had a big wave in 1992, uh, where a bunch of Democratic candidates, female candidates, won. Uh, Bill Clinton won the presidency in 1992. It was a presidential year, Marjorie, so, and it was also a long time ago. Our politics have changed. We're a lot more partisan, a lot more polarized now. But I do think that's one of the things that Democrats, uh, some Democrats, are at least hoping that some version of that. Um, yeah. you know, when when Jim, Jim asked me what is issue number one, you know, I just spoke as John King, 58-year-old man, you know, product of Dorchester, Massachusetts. I can't speak for a suburban woman out there for whom this might be a more important issue, nor can I speak for an evangelical who, for whom it might be a very important issue. Historically, uh, courts, judges, abortion have been more of a driver on the right yep. for conservative and Republican candidates. Does that mean they cannot be for the left, uh, for Democrats in this election? Of course it does not. Uh, so I think that's one of the things to study as we go through the year. Uh, more of an issue on the right, I would argue, because the right existed. In I don't mean the right as in right wing, but the, the right, right to, to reproductive freedom. Right. Yes existed right. and now yep. obviously it's at a risk john last thing for me is june 9th i think it is the january 6th hearings start in prime time i saw a little headline on your station i can't remember last night or this morning saying uh will the january 6th committee ask trump or pence to testify if they did uh, i'm assuming it's obvious that trump would refuse to testify would mike pence show up uh, I don't think I think they would have to negotiate that. I think his instinct, his reflex would be no uh, at this moment. Uh, I saw one of the members of the committee, Pete Aguilar, on our air this morning who said that they still haven't decided uh, who those witnesses should be and they haven't sent out the invitations yet. Uh, so I would say to the committee, which I think I, I you know, complimented many times here, I think has done a more thorough, methodical job than any of us expected or most mm -hmm. of us expected early on. Uh, they better get going. Uh, you know, because it's a lot of the people they want to bring in have, uh, you know, either complicated schedules or could come up with a complicated schedule if they didn't want to come in. Uh, so I, 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 my gut instinct is we're not going to see Pence or Trump, uh, the former vice president or the former president. But I think that, you know, we'll see how the committee uh, wants to play this out. But what, what the committee people tell you, Jim, is that it's actually the mid-level people the staff members, the executive assistants, the people who control the schedule, get all the documents come across their desk. Those have been the most valuable witnesses in building actually the very thorough timeline they've built. Are those the most compelling witnesses on television for televised hearings? Maybe not, uh, but I, 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 they view this as a prosecution. So think more, I think I would think more of a court TV than a high drama in what they're trying to do, but we'll see when they have the witness list. Well, I'm just thinking back to Watergate. Wasn't the, what was the name of the guy who disclosed the tape system for Nixon uh, oh, no gosh. one butter somebody or something. Butterfield? Was it? We had but no, never heard of him before, but obviously he electrified yeah. the world, right? So I assume there are others uh, to come. Um, just give us an, uh, an update, too, on what, what we think is going to happen or what you think is going to happen. Uh, Donald Trump uh, uh, came through in Ohio for J.D. Vance, who, of course, is the author of Hillbilly Elegy. He's running as a Republican there for the Senate. M movie was made of Hillbilly Elegy. He's kind of a minor celebrity. But Trump has also put his support behind um, Dr. Oz, who obviously was a big-time celebrity in Pennsylvania. I think the election is May 17th. So um, w where is the uh, drag or lack thereof if, if the president, former president endorses you? It seemed to have worked very well in Ohio. Uh, right now, you'd have to say it helps, but with the small pot of evidence we have right now, by the end of the month, we'll have more. We have two races tonight. Uh, in West Virginia, there's uh, two Republican House members who have to run against each other because the state lost a seat 
uh, in the post-census reapportionment. Uh, so you have Alex Mooney, who has Trump's endorsement, uh, running against David McKinley, who's endorsed by the Republican establishment and by the Democratic Senator Joe Manchin. That's a classic Trump versus the Republican mm. establishment. Uh, Alex Mooney's in the Freedom Caucus. Uh, he's more of a Trumpy guy in the House. Uh, McKinley voted for the Biden bipartisan infrastructure bill and voted to create an independent January 6th commission. So he's out of Trump's favor for those two votes there. Uh, so watch how that one plays out. Uh, the Nebraska governor's race, Trump has endorsed a businessman who I believe it's eight, several women have been uh, yes. accused of touching them inappropriately. Yep. Yep. But again, again, Trump has long been at war with the Republican governor there who's term limited. Pete Ricketts, more of an establishment, uh, another businessman, but an establishment guy. So this is Trump versus the establishment in Nebraska tonight, in West Virginia tonight. Then it'll be Pennsylvania next week, Georgia at the end of the month. At the end of the month, we'll be able to build a pretty good report card. But every week we have these Trump stories. As of now, Trump's happy with what happened in Ohio, but two more tonight. We'll see. You know, I read a Starling's uh, number this morning or yesterday about West Virginia, the race there, and where the former President Trump is upset with this guy for voting for the infrastructure um, bill, that um, West Virginia was going to get $6 billion in infrastructure a spending six billion dollars that's huge and it's a very poor state so it would seem that any kind of bill they could vote for for in west virginia would be a good thing but um anyway i guess he was criticized for supporting trump trump was just mad that biden got what he always wanted that big infrastructure bill. that's <laughs> all it is john king thank john, you so great much to see you. be well talk to you next week thank Take you care, very john. much that was john king he's cnn's chief national correspondent he's also the host of inside politics which we watch every day right here in the studio at noon. And thank you very much, John King, for being with us. Coming up, gas prices, as we just said, they've hit an all-time high. We're opening the lines to hear how you're enduring if you're having a breakdown every time you get to the gas pump. That is next on Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. <laughs> During the campaign, President Biden promised to end drilling on federal lands. Last month, he reversed course. We're discussing the implications of this new policy direction on midterm politics and on the efforts to halt climate change. I'm Melissa Harris-Perry, and that's next time on The Takeaway from WNYC and PRX. This afternoon at 2, here on GBH News 89.7. Support for GBH comes from you and Mass Autobahn, where you can get outdoors and experience wildlife sanctuaries across the state, from the Cape to the Berkshires. You can join today. The adventure starts at massautobahn.org. And Arts Emerson. In Seasick, science journalist Alana Mitchell explores the secrets of the ocean to find hope in the face of climate change. May 11th through the 22nd at the Paramount. Tickets at artsemerson.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browning and Marge Regan, live from the Boston Public Library, streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. By the way, there's a question, I think, for you, Marjorie. Uh, genius of the pla uh, places. Uh, I don't know what that means. But in any case, also, do you need tickets to see the show? No, you do not. At the Boston Public Library. It's Diane from Medford. It's one of your favorite topics. Do you, Marjorie? You do not need tickets, and you can just show up, and you can stay for as long or as little as you want, and get a nice little lunch over there at the Newsfeed Cafe. But... You didn't mention Laura. I she purposely didn't mention Laura. Laura said she oh, actually. Oh, no, this is a different one. Go ahead. Yeah, she tuned in and heard the conversation about the Kentucky mm -hmm. Derby and Secretary's 1973 Triple Crown win yeah. at Belmont. She said, I was transported back to June 9th, 1973, when I and two of my fellow 19-year-old girlfriends were standing at the fence directly in front of the Belmont Stakes finish line. No. And cry that's what she says, crying, screaming, tears of joy as the best horse of all time won that race that's incredible imagine that no I my can't. life would have been transformed jim who knows where i might have gone had i had been, been at the exactly fence in front of that fantastic win by secretariat in any case the national average for a gallon of fuel right now is four dollars and 36 cents highest it's ever been nationally highest it's ever been in massachusetts the rise is tied to the rippling effects of bans on russian oil imports affecting the global market even if the u.s doesn't get much of its oil from russia the rest of the world does when we last check in with listeners about the cost of gas, most of you said you could front the higher prices knowing it was the right thing to do. But weeks into it, 
how are you adjusting? You find yourself stopping short of a fill up, doing the mental math to figure out how far 20 bucks will get you at this time and what tips and tricks are you using to make the fuel you do buy go a little further. You can text us or call us at 877-301-8970. Email us at BPR at WGBH.org. Are you changing any of your driving behaviors because of the price of gas? No, because I have a hybrid, and I get unbelievably great mileage. It's not an electric car, but it's close. I mean, I can drive a long 38 miles to the gallon, Jim. I can drive a long way without having to fill up my tank. Do you know what I did? I think I just said this on the air a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, I went to the gas station, and I was the price was astronomical. Uh, and I only got like $20 in gas, and I left. <laughs> And as I'm driving away, I'm saying, I have no idea why I did that. I mean, I assume I heard on the radio, yep. someone said, you know, a lower income worker said, yep. I couldn't afford to fill my tank, yeah. but I could afford you to could fill afford my tank. Gym. Plus you got that, s those swank wheels. Too. Thank you. Why do you like think I did that? Mobile. Why do you think I did that? Uh, it, well, you have a lot of neuroses, Jim. Thank I guess you. That's another one of them. 877-301-8970. <laughs> and by the way, what I am doing uh, to save gas, uh -huh. I will not be using my air conditioning this <laughs> year. Yeah. No, in the car. I'll be driving with my head out the window. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that will work. 877-301-8970. You know, I was listening to NPR this morning. Uh -huh. This is not uh, individuals. This is a business person. This guy drove a truck. I can't remember what kind of truck. And, and the NPR report said as much as gas for consumers has gone up diesel has gone up 78 percent i think in a year this guy who drives a truck for a living says it ordinarily costs him 700 dollars to fill his tank it's now a thousand dollars well you feel terrible i mean for these I, truckers I how mean, do you do this it, well i think you, you you lose a lot of money i mean as we're just talking about with john kink and you get go on a summer vacation this year with your family I, I mean maybe not i mean gas prices are a big deal but you know that is another advertisement though for electric cars and for hybrids. I mean, it is unbelievable, the difference. I, I, I know people that drive cars that get like 10 miles to gallon. Are you kidding me? But the problem is they cost uh, more right for now. the most part than the gas guzzlers. So you, you. Well, I don't think that's true. You can get it. You well, can some get of the small, Chevy, yeah, maybe you're right. you can get a Toyota, you can get a lot of cars. So here's some other things you can use. You watch your speed. You drive 50 to 55 miles an hour. When was the last time you uh, drove only 55 miles an hour on a highway. I would say it would be a long time ago, Jim. I'd say a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, a long time ago. You, like a, you drive like an old lady. I, dri I do drive like an old lady. I drive no the speed limit all the time for environmental and other reasons. You're supposed to avoid excessive idling. I'm waiting for to get pulled over for taking a right turn on red. You know, it's Why? Really because, because they don't have signs all the time. Well, if there's no sign, you're allowed to take it. That's right. Only if it says no turn I on know, red. I know, but have you noticed in Massachusetts how persnickety we are about this? Yeah. There's all these intersections that you could take a right on after stopping for a red light, and they won't let you do it for stupid reasons. And you're sitting there and sitting there and sitting there wasting all those gas. Oh, I see what you're saying. Unless, of course, you have a hybrid, because at that point, the car is not running on Excellent gas. Point. It's running on the battery. Do you want to hear what Joe Biden had to say this morning sure. on the effort to fight inflation, I assume, including gas prices? Here's the president. Well, all of my plan is focused on lowering costs for the average family in America, to give them just a little bit of breathing room. Now, what's the congressional Republican plan? They don't want to solve inflation by lowering their costs. They want to solve it by raising your taxes and lowering your income. I happen to think it's a good thing when American families have a little more money in their pockets at the end of the month. In any case, let's go to West Newbury. Molly is on the phone. Molly, you're joining us at the Boston Public Library. Hey, Molly, what's up? Hi. Well, Hi. I'm in my car, and I'm driving 55 or 65 on cruise control as cars are flying by. Good for we you. We also own a hybrid, and we have solar on the house. So we are, wow. just, which was way before this all happened, but we, were, we saw the writing on the wall, and we should have listened to Jimmy Carter back, way back when. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, turning down the heat in his cardigan sweater. What I was mean, the heat in the White House? Fifty-eight degrees or some? No, I think like it was. I think it was in the sixties, wasn't it? It was obscenely low. I don't I think mean, it was obscenely low. I think it was in the sixties, and everybody maybe. totally freaked out about it. Well, that's the problem. Molly, good for you. I mean, some of Thank these you. things are going to be um, um, painful. Painful. Yeah. By the way, how about this? This is a much better idea. Thirty-three sixty-nine texts in. Mm -hmm. I've been only driving downhill for the past two <laughs> weeks. 
<laughs> that clearly that is, saves a, a lot of gas. is a trick That's right. that works. Listen yeah. to this. This is from 7741. My Prius hybrid gets 60 miles to the gallon in warm weather at low speeds. 60 miles to the gallon. And then we have 5147 who says, my car is diesel, $77 to fill it up. 17 says, best way to save gas, ride a bike, Jim. I know. I know. Uh, didn't Jared say, were we not allowed to say this in the air? Ja I can't believe Jared didn't brag. Didn't yep. he ride a blue bike to the he studio today? a blue today? bike, which is pretty impressive. Pretty incredible. Let's go to Joan in New Hampshire. You're next on Boston Public Radio. Joan, welcome to the show. We're talking about gas prices. Now people are coping. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Thank you. So, I also have a hybrid, and, um, and, and I've started lowering my speed. So I average about 42 miles a gallon. I've been coordinating my trips, but my ace in the hole is coming out in a week. It's my 1975 Volkswagen Beetle that I'll probably fill up and drive it all summer without filling it again. You have a 1975 Beetle? I do. It was my dream car. I got it out in Brimfield. I've slowly been working on getting rid of the drum brakes, which were terrifying. Whatever they are, um, yeah. I know. I oh, they were terrible. And um, I got disc brakes. I've had the car painted. I have a sound system that is equal to Boston Gardens. Cause wow. Wow. Great. Have it loud. It's got to be loud. And I just got a brand new hand sewn roof from my mechanic's friend who works for Mercedes. So the car is in mint condition and I'm coming out next week and I can't wait to get it on. Hey, the Joan, road. send us a picture. Uh, you sound pretty proud. BPR at WGBH. Dot org. Thanks for the call and good luck with the 70 something Beetle. We appreciate it. One of the texters just said that many non hybrid shut off the engines when stopped now, too. I didn't know they that. They do? I didn't know that. I didn't know about that either. Yeah, because where do they get the uh, energy from? I'm not the sure. Oh, I know. By the way, ex you touch on avoid excessive idling is a real ba uh, yep. big thing. Fast pass. Do you believe that there are still people that don't have. <laughs> I mean, I. I is that because you don't want the man I knowing so. where you I are? Guess so. Is that what it is? I guess so. You just want to wait and get a ticket in the mail from the uh, from the uh, highway companies. But you can get fast pass. You can go all the way from here to Philadelphia. I know. It's and Probably even further. Maybe you can go to Florida. I don't know. Um, somebody just texted and wants to know why we aren't talking about the oil company making record profits. I think there is a little, lot, the, a little uh, price gouging going on, Jim, wouldn't you say? You know, uh, uh, well, yeah, I would say. Let's go to where are we going next? 877-301-8970. Gregory's on the road somewhere. Gregory, welcome to the show. Hi. Well, thank you for having me. Thank uh, you. I drive, an F, I drive an F-150. It's a V8, and uh, I'm a homeowner. I'm not getting another car. I do a lot of stuff for myself. Uh, it's approximately about $84 to fill up right now. Wow. And I'm not, I'm not able to fill up because of the higher cost of food. If you notice, uh, just at your deli car, food has gone up. I, I looked at uh, just regular ham the other day it was ten dollars a pound uh, I, I think people have to realize that every cost has gone up food gas uh and, and also repair costs as well to maintain your vehicle well you know gregory one of the things you said you had an f uh, f-150 f-150 you know what surprised me um because they introduced the electric f-150s i have no idea how much they cost um, but I was surprised at how much interest there was. It sold out in like a minute. Yes, in, in, in those cars. And the beauty, the other thing about electric vehicles is that you save a lot of money in maintenance because they don't need all the uh, oil changes, et cetera, and other things that uh, gas cars do. So, I mean, they're really expensive. You know, now is not a good time to buy a new car for most people, but down the line maybe. Hey, Gregory, what have you cut out or what have you scaled back uh, to deal with the – all the pressures, the financial pressures. Uh, both gas and food. I can't fill up. Um, if you know, if I get to three quarters of a tank, so be it. Uh, or if I have to buy less food or uh, baking bread. I've been baking bread more than I've been buying bread lately. Wow. Oh my gosh! Where'd you, so learn you to, where'd you learn to bake bread, Gregory? Uh, it's just it's just something that needed to be done because a loaf of bread is going up to. Three, four dollars, even five dollars, as some of the prices that I've seen. Hey, Gregory, Whereas before you, I'm sorry, before you go, do you is do you do you feel that your leaders have let you down, or that this is unavoidable with the war in Ukraine and all the other factors that <coughs> are percolating around? Well, I remember when Trump was in office, gas was two dollars, uh, and the economy was doing very well. I think it was up 26 percent at the end of 2019, and before COVID hit. Uh, jobs are out there. 
uh, there, there is plenty of work for everybody. I make a good living, but I, I've had to cut back substantially. Hey, Gregory, uh, one last question. How big is the gas tank on your on your truck? It's 20 gallons. Wow. Yeah, wow. And, and, you know, I feel bad for uh, independent contractors who have to, you know, so guys that bank yeah. for a living. Guys that are driving F-250s or F-350s, I know they're, they're paying over $100 a tank. Oh. Hey, uh, Gregory, we appreciate your sharing your situation with us, and we wish you a lot of luck. Thank you very much for the call. Uh, do you hear what uh, Donald Trump, two bucks a gallon, uh, Joe Biden, he didn't say this, $4.30 well, a gallon. Well, I think I think that's why uh, the Democrats are so worried about the elections, because the economy and everybody's 401ks were going up big time during the Trump uh, administration. You know, what, you know what's incredible? I'm listen sorry. This one. This is what 8184. Should I say these numbers? I just read the text. Why am I saying the numbers? I, I, so I don't know. Okay. I'll just not say the numbers. Okay. Uh, here's a text that says, I was going to cash in my IRA to get some gas, but I just checked, and my IRA isn't worth anything uh, anymore. Well, it's not funny, but it's unfortunately. It's not funny. You know, a, a friend <laughs> of mine. My advice during these hard times is don't check. A friend just of don't mine check. texted me this morning about something that's a supply chain mm -hmm. and an inflation. Uh, you reading about baby formula and how it's almost impossible to yeah. get in a lot of stores are limiting that. the amount. People are hysterical. But you know what I don't understand about Biden and the Democrats since considering they control this, instead of just showing empathy for uh, people who are suffering, like Gregory a minute ago, like John King was talking about, his yep. off the script thing, why don't they pick one thing and tackle it so it's concrete? Why don't they, I mean, again, I'm thinking out loud, why don't they invoke the Defense Production Act for baby formula? I mean, even if you don't have a little kid, is there anybody who's heard that story who doesn't have great sympathy for the parent of the young yeah. kid or kids who is worried about where the next Why meal? Why didn't they try one thing and build back better, like 7% of your income for child care? No, I just don't understand it. Why Solve can't, one problem why can't to show that Joe you can. Why can't Joe Biden, the most powerful man on earth, persuade uh, Joe Manchin to do something? Well, I, to, to that. I mean, I think that's one of the peop reasons people are, are frustrated with Biden, even Democrats, thinking, what can he do? Well, the answer is you do the things you can do with executive power to show that you don't just care rhetorically, but I you mean, care in an, in an active Bill kind of McKibben way. Bill was talking about the fact that while we're all being held heat hostage pumps. by oil pi yep. prices and gas You're prices, right. that we could all be heating our houses right now with heat pumps. And but much of Western Europe But as why well. won't they send them to uh, over there so that so the Germans wouldn't be uh, you know, uh, supporting the Russian war effort? And he said invoke the Defense Production yes. Act for the manufacture of those here too. Yes, I don't know I don't why he isn't either. doing a million of these Ellen things. and Merrimack, New Hampshire, you have 45 seconds. It's all yours. Take it away. Oh, thank you very much. Sure. I um, drive a Beetle, a Volkswagen Beetle. Wow. I live 10 minutes away from home. I filled up last week. I filled up every two weeks, and it was $23 the last time I filled up. So I'm grateful for my car and where I live and where I work. We're glad to hear it all, Ellen. Thanks for calling. You know what you didn't mention, what you said what we were talking about mention? doing this this morning? Is this going to lead to another trend as several years ago we lived through? People stopped buying these, like, Cars the size of buses. I don't know why people I mean, buy think the about cars all these the size Beatles of, of buses. I know people say, "Well, I have lots of kids," but you can still get a hybrid with lots of kids on a Highlander. That's a big car. That, that or you can put a kid on the roof like Mitt Romney did. Strap right thing. up there. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that was his dog, actually. Put the car seat right up there. Remember Jim, the dog's name? Uh, Seamus. Seamus. Very Seamus good. Was on, yeah, Seamus was on the roof. It was very embarrassing. We're done. We're done. Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. You did a nice job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for showing up, Jim. I really appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Marjorie's stalling because she doesn't know what no, she's supposed to say. No, oh, I found did? my okay, page. I found my page. I'm all set. Okay. I want to let you know what we're doing tomorrow. Oh, what are we doing well, tomorrow? Well, tomorrow I'm going to be joined by a Boston police reformer, Jamal Crawford. I'm going to talk to him about the not so many reforms that we're seeing from the Boston Police Department. Two local historians who host a podcast delving into the cultural impact of Oprah. I am so excited oh, about this. Oh, that's the podcast that we were talking yes, about last week. Absolutely. Journalist Kim Kelly on her new book about the history of America labor organizing, which is going to be fascinating too. We're going to talk to, uh, we want to thank our crew, Zoe Matthews, Aidan Conley, Mackenzie Farkas, Rebecca Tauber, our engineer, John the Cloth Parker. Uh, and Bill Pacitelli is today is running the board for us, and we very much appreciate Bill. Thank you so much, Bill. Our executive producer for Jenny is Jenny Bologna. We thank him every day. Special thanks to the BPL engineering team, Rob Fagnett and Taya 
Matalesi. Do you want to thank the people who came? Yes, we do. We want thank to thank you very everybody. much for coming. We Sorry I can't it. see everybody. I'm hidden behind this huge TV camera. That's, that's here because of Jim's TV show. That's why that camera's here. And I want you to know Marjorie is going to walk around and hand <laughs> show you one by one all of the things she <laughs> held up before. So that's don't right. go away. So thank you very much uh, for people that came down to the library today. Thank you to the rest of you at home or the people that were on the, uh, the uh, YouTube thing. YouTube thing. Yeah. Th watching on the YouTube thing. I could show them the pictures. Anyway, I am Marjorie Egan. Uh, I am Jim Browning. Thank you very much again for tuning Thank in today. You. We hope you can tune in tomorrow. And meanwhile, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. See you tomorrow. Bye.